Good afternoon. It's January 30th at 1.30 p.m. sharp. Uh, and this is the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee. We're here today for a panel discussion uh, on the state of rental housing affordability in Montgomery County. We have a very tight uh, timeline here, uh, trying to get a lot of uh, perspectives uh, in uh, here in a three-hour time span. Really appreciate everybody joining uh, for us and appreciate the fact that we have a, a pretty uh, good size uh, crowd as well. Um, uh, really excited to have this conversation to discuss the state of rental housing affordability in the county. I'm really grateful to the diverse group of experts who are giving their time to help us better understand through data the economics of housing and the dynamics surrounding rent burden and rent relief currently in Montgomery County. Housing affordability, as we all know, is among the top issues facing Montgomery County and will be a primary focus of this committee moving forward, which has already started to work on these uh, issues in just the first meeting that we had uh, last week. This conversation today is intended to serve as a foundation for future policy discussions. To be clear, there is no specific proposal before us today, and this conversation is not in any way intended to be a debate. We have no decision points before us, no predetermined outcomes, only an effort to have a broad set of views to fully understand the breadth and magnitude of this important issue. To be clear, this is a briefing and discussion, not a public hearing or work session, where information will be shared with committee members, and uh, committee members will be able to ask questions at the end of each panel. We look forward to a thoughtful discussion today, and as we do in all council and committee meetings, we fully expect that everyone here today participating and listening will remain respectful throughout. We're on a very tight schedule with four panels, starting with an overview of research data and a rental study update, perspectives from nonprofit and public housing providers, large and small private sector housing providers, and organizations representing renters, and then the executive branch to update us on renter relief and support for rent renters programs. Uh, now I want to turn it over to my colleagues to give brief welcoming remarks, and then we will call up our first panel. I think last week I started and turned it over to Councilmember Joanda, so I'll turn it over to Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez. Good, after good afternoon, everyone. My name is Natalie Fanny Gonzalez. I'm ready to start this meeting. That's all I had to say. Let's go. Sounds good. And with that, Councilmember Joanda. I thought I was going to be able to throw some nuts and berries in my mouth. I wasn't able to, but that's okay. I'll do that after. Um, good to be here uh, with everybody and appreciate the chair and my, my colleague, uh, mm -hmm. Councilmember Natalie, Natalie Fanny Gonzalez. Just uh, very briefly, we all know affordable housing and housing in general is a challenge for everybody. I think it's one of the great things that actually gives us opportunity here. If you ask the, some of the wealthier people in our county what they have a challenge with, they're going to tell you housing. You ask their lowest income residents, they're going to say housing. It's at every price point. It's at every household it's hurting every member of our community in some way or the other from the youngest to the most senior who are trying to stay here um, preliminary demographic data shows us that of that group though 84 percent of renters making less than seventy five thousand dollars a year are rent burdened eighty four percent and seventy five thousand not a not our lowest income uh, that means they're spending thirty forty fifty percent of their income on rent when you do that, you don't spend it on other things. Um, and that's a big problem. We know that nearly 40% of our county are renters now, 37% or so. We'll hear more about that later. And this impacts all communities. Uh, I'm the chair of the Education Committee. I was just at two of our schools today, uh, speaking with elementary and high school students in the Northwood cluster. No less than 10 students pulled me aside or said to me directly that they are having trouble with their families affording a place to live. One student is living at a day's end, thankfully subsidized by the county, but it's poorly maintained. This is an issue for everyone in our community. I appreciate the chair and my colleagues uh, taking it and tackling it with seriousness, and we're gonna need an all hands on deck approach. So I look forward to talking to the panel today and getting into all the landscape that's gonna help us with the solutions to solve this problem for our residents. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for that, Councilmember Joanna. Thank you, Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. We're going to call up our first panel and get started. Uh, first panel is on rental housing overview, research data, and rental study update. We have Tanya Stern, the acting director of the Montgomery County Planning Department, and Lisa Gavoni, a housing planner there, who uh, both uh, are no strangers uh, to this committee and to this council. Uh, Natalia Carasosa and Stephanie Bryant from Office of Legislative Oversight, and 
Paul Desjardins, Director, Department of Community Planning Services for Metro Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. Uh, we'll start with the Planning Department, who I believe has a presentation for us, and we have uh, Ms. Dunn, who I really appreciate her and want to acknowledge her help putting together uh, today's panel discussion, uh, as well as uh, the rest of the Council staff uh, as well. And with that, we'll uh, turn to you, Ms. Stern. Thank you so much, Council Members. Uh, Tanya Stern, Acting Planning Director from the Planning Department. Just wanted to say very briefly that we are very happy to be here uh, to help set the stage and to provide this data about the rental housing market um, and to help inform the Councils uh, in the communities uh, conversations and solutions um, seeking for this important issue for, for our county. So with that, I will turn it over to Lisa Gavoni, who will lead the presentation. Good afternoon, council members. For the record, Lisa Gavoni with the Planning Department, where I'm a housing planner. So I'm really excited to be here to give uh, presentations that's divided into really two halves. First, we're going to walk through some census demographic information, which Mr. Dumondo spoiled a couple of my, my data points there. That's OK. And then we'll go through some CoStar uh, market data to kind of give a whole picture of the rental market in Montgomery County. Next slide. So the county has about 133,000 renter households. And from 1990, we've increased that number by about 42,000, which to put in perspective, for every one owner household we're adding, we're adding two renter households. So we're really starting to see the shift kind of pick up, especially since 2010. Um, we're also seeing that the average household size of renters is increasing. In 2010, the average household size was about 2.4, and now it's up to 2.5. So we're seeing more renters, but we're seeing more households, bigger households as renters. Next slide. So this is uh, another graph that shows the tenure of um, by age. And when we look at the age of renters, it's really not surprising that the highest number of renters are belong to that 25 to 35 age cohort. But that really doesn't tell the whole story. Um, so we know millennials are delaying home buyer due to preferences or are being priced out of the market. But 70% 70, 70 of our renters are over age 35. And 46% of our renters are over age 45. And what this is telling us is that the delaying of home buying is really extending past the millennial cohort. It's really a trend that has continuing to households, uh, renter households that are in the 45 to 55 range. Um, and we're really only seeing new homeowners added to the 55 and plus age cohort. And also, when we look at um, the 75 to an older cohort, we're seeing that they're delaying the transition to renter households. So they're wanting to stay in their homes for longer. They want to age in place. They want to be in their home for longer. Next slide. So we talked about on the first slide that you know 35% of all county households are renter households. But disparities do exist by race and ethnicity. About 22% of white alone householders are renters, but that number jumps to 58% for black or African American households and 45% for Hispanic or Latina households in 2021. Since 2010, the number of renter households has increased on net from nearly on every race except for white alone householders, where it's declined slightly. The biggest increase on net is for black renter households, Hispanic renter households, and some other uh, race households. This, the chart also shows a comparison between 2010 and 2021, where you can see that nearly the percentage of renters of total households has gone up nearly every race except for white owned households, where it's declined slightly. Next slide. And this, is, this slide shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. It's tenure by units and structure. So we can see that 88% of owner households, they live in single unit attached or detached structures, whereas 73% of renter households, they live in multifamily structures with at least five units. Next slide. Um, so this is a really interesting slide that I think um, we don't talk about nearly enough, is that renters are really mobile. They are especially mobile when you look at their by income, but the median year for renters that moved into their unit was 2017. 70% of renters moved into their unit in 2015, whereas the inverse is true for owners, where 77% of owners moved in after 2015. This trend in mobility, like I said, is especially pronounced for lower income households, um, where over half of lower income households that earn under 35%, they move, they've been in their unit for less than two years. And this is 
difference, as I, th I think you can see where I'm going, is that this primarily reflects the higher turnover rate and how it primarily reflects the housing instability that is faced by a lot of lower income renters in the county. Next slide. So um, this is a point we've talked about a lot, especially in our master plans, is that our rental housing stock is aging. Um, the median year built for our rental housing stock is 1983, and 46% was built before 1980. And I, I want to hammer home this point because we actually haven't seen a lot of redevelopment of naturally occurring affordable housing in the county. I've spent a lot of time analyzing demolition permits in the county. We've seen 10 redevelopments of multifamily projects since 2000 in the county. That's not to say that we won't see more in the future, when, but redevelopment is part of a healthy ecosystem in the county. And you know, a lot of the projects that we're seeing, the redevelopment of older naturally occurring affordable housing is from HOC think projects like Chevy Chase Lake, the Lindley, the Bonifant, where we're seeing an increase in affordability. So I, I just had to put a little plug in there. Next slide. This looks at median income by tenure. Um, Montgomery County's median income in the current five-year ACS is about $117,000. This number increases to over 150 for owners and declines by almost $80,000 to $72,000 for renter households. But I don't think that's telling the whole story. So if you go to the next slide. 35% of renters, they make under $50,000 a year. But if you look at this chart and you look at the maroon and the light blue, you can see that 34% of renters are making over $100,000. Um, and this is a really important piece that we'll talk about, but we're seeing bifurcated rental growth, both the lower end and the higher end. We're adding a lot of low-income housings, but we're also adding a lot of high-income households, too. But not surprisingly, when we look at owners, it's a different story. Um, nearly 70% of owners make over $100,000 a year, and we're only seeing new owners on net on the 150K segment. So it's very likely that we're going to see a trend where we're going to see more high-income renters in the county, too. Next slide. So the percent of cost burden renters in the county where they're spending more than 30% of their income on housing costs has remained about 50% of the total share of households since about 2010. And this is mainly for the fact that what we just talked about, that bifurcated income growth, where we're adding low income households and we know that they're cost burden, but we're also adding high income cost burden House, high income households that aren't necessarily cost burden to the renter demographic. Next slide. And this kind of leads well into um, where cost burden renter households and who is the most cost burden. So um, if you look at this chart, we have on the left we have cost burden that's greater than 30%. These are the AMI of all the residents that are cost burden at 30%. And you can see that cost burdening is largely a phenomenon of lower income households. So the blue and the green, they, re they are household income under 30% AMI and household income 30 to 50% of AMI. And that's about 72% of cost burden households. So like I said, it's, it's largely a phenomenon that's only operating in the low, income the low income sphere. And then if you look at the right, these are severely cost burden households. And you can see that it's even more dire that 96% of all severely cost burden households, they have an income under 50% AMI, which is about $70,000 for a family of four. Next slide. So next, we're gonna talk a little bit about data um, from CoStar, which is a, a resident, uh, a database that provides us um, rents and vacancy rates, and I'm going to read this slide because I think it's really important to get all my caveats out, is that the data on the slides which is from CoStar, which provides data and analytics on real estate markets. The market rents reported to CoStar represent the current asking rents of available units. This data does not include in-place or renewal rates. What this means is that if an existing tenant if they receive a rent, rental renewal with an increase and they accept that renewal, they're not included in this database. If an existing tenant receives a rent renewal and chooses to vacate that unit, that current asking rent for a new lease that's available is included in this data. And then additionally, CoStar, they, you, they do try to capture specials and concessions like a free month rent, and they only really focus on that market that like that um, the concessions that are monetarily based. 
And again, CoStar data, it speaks to trends, to, market, to the market, and it's not necessarily the experience of every renter in the county. So next slide. So next we're going to start with a series of graphs on the overall rental market in the county with data from CoStar. The first graph shows the market rent of units and rent growth in the county and both the asking rent, which is that first orange line, and the effective rent, which is the green line, which and the difference between the two is a concession, basically, you know, free month rent, free parking. And then the blue bars, they show the average rent growth, year over year change, and the rent charge from the previous bar. As you can tell, the county, like many other jurisdictions following a national trend, they experienced uh, decline in rent growth in 2020. And this is, again, largely following trends nationally and regionally. And then in 2021, we experienced very high rent growth. Um, and, but then in 2022, we kind of saw this fall back. We saw this fall back to the, you know, the market tried to correct itself in 2021, but in 2022 had mostly come back down to be in line with trends from the previous years. Um, and it's too early to look at 2023 data, but it seems like from looking at this data, and we'll go through more data, a lot of 2020 and 2021 were outliers more than a trend that we're going to see pronounced in the future. Next slide. So this graph shows the same data, but it adjusts for inflation. And so a couple of caveats here is, we all know that we are operating in high inflationary markets. So we thought it was important to show both cases. We know that the price of goods has risen, um, especially for operating uh, multifamily building. It's only gotten more expensive. But we also know that you know it's very likely that renters, if they received a high incre increase, their income did not grow this over the same amount of period to really be able to catch up with inflation. But again, it's still important to show both uh, inflation adjusted and um, regular dollars. And so after adjusting for inflation, you can see that our rent growth is, is pretty modest. We actually average negative 0.5% rent growth over the past 10 years. Um, and I think, you know, that's really important and I would caution, you know, to not make any snap judgments between this data, but it is to show a trend that we're seeing, especially operating this inflationary market that we're, we're not keeping up. Next slide. So next we're going to look at rents and the growth of different market segments. First we're going to look at um, county, seg county sub-markets. So the average asking rent per square foot in the county is about $2.11, and which is about 1940 for as a weighted average for all units. And then when we look at some of our more urban markets, we see, you know, Bethesda, North Bethesda, Silver Spring, they have higher rents per square feet than the county on average due to you know, their location, their higher amenities, the higher cost of land. And then we see that you know, our more suburban markets, especially Gaithersburg and Germantown, they have, there are more affordable markets in the county. And with Wheaton and Glenmont kind of in the, the middle between, you know, it's a suburban market, but not as urban as Bethesda and Silver Spring. So next slide. So this slide shows the rent growth from 2019 to 2022, year over year, by submarket in the county. So, one interesting thing that I'll lean on is that our more suburban markets, like Germantown and Gaithersburg, they actually saw modest rent growth, a little bit of a bump in 2020. And I think that largely has to do with one, they're more affordable, there's more space, which was at a premium during COVID. And then in 2021, we saw big rebounds in many of the counties markets, the biggest in North Bethesda and Germantown. Germantown was a little bit of a surprise given that they had seen a modest bump in 2020, but if you look at the 2022 year, you can see that they actually saw a decline in rent growth, and I think that was largely because the market tried to overcorrect in 2021 and then wasn't able to compensate for those, those rents, and so you saw a little bit of a decline there. But this is an interesting example because we has, as we know, it has the highest rents in the county. It saw a pretty big dip in 2020, but not as big as the correction in 2021. I can only hypothesize why that's just true, and I think 
Part of it is that Bethesda is really good at adding housing more than any other jurisdiction. They've had 1,600 units to their inventory since 2017, which is just a remarkable, and that really does help put pressure on rents to keep them from these big jumps that we saw. Next slide. Next, we look at rents and rent growth by jurisdiction. Regionally and comparatively, our rent per square foot is lower than all other jurisdictions besides Prince George's. And this has a lot to do with, we have, a, we have both a lot of urban markets and suburban markets. And you can tell that when you look at our urban markets, they compete really well with our regional neighbors. It's when you look at the more exurban suburban markets that kind of bring the rent per square foot down that we, so, but moving on to the next slide. So in 2020, um, Prince George's County was the only jurisdiction to not see declining rent growth in 2020. But comparatively to our neighbors, we saw the smallest dip outside of Prince George's County compared to our regional neighbors. We also, we also saw less rent growth than Fairfax and Arlington in 2021, but more than DC and Prince George's County. In 2022, we continued to be kind of this middle of the pack regionally where DC and Prince George's County, they saw the le less growth rent on average than us, where, while Arlington and Fairfax saw higher rent growth. So one of the interesting things that COSTAR does is it evaluates and assigns each building in its, in its database a building class. Um, it, it's pretty self-explanatory, but class A is your state of the art. You're generally your highest grade, your best locations, your best building materials, your newest product. Um, class C is a lot of our naturally occurring affordable housing. It's older, it has less amenities, and it um, has a lower rent than class B and A. And B is kind of that in between between your best multifamily, your class A, and your class C older naturally occurring affordable housing. So not surprisingly, class A has the highest rents and class C has the lower, lo lowest rents. Mm -hmm. Next slide. But what I think it's interesting here is you see a very pronounced trend here. Class A multifamily had the biggest dip in rents in 2020, but it had the highest rebounding growth in 2021 and the smallest amount of rent growth in 2022. But you look at the inverse for class C where the multifamily had the smallest dip in 2020, the least amount of rent growth in 2021, but the biggest growth in 2022. And so I only have, I have one slide left, but I think that these trends are really important. And I wanna emphasize that when we're looking at the trends of the rent data, what we really see is a lot of markets declined, a lot of rents declined in 2020. And then we saw a huge attempt at an overcorrection in 2021. And then 2022, we started to see product and multifamily rents really back into the average and I think that, you know, that's generally the case. And I, I believe when we move on in 2023 and we start to get data, we'll see similar story here where we'll we start to see rent growth more in line with the average. So the last slide I have is on vacancy rates. So the 10 year vacancy rate in the county is we average about 5.7%. Um, in 2021, we saw pretty much the, one of the lowest uh, vacancy rates on record, we had a sub 5% at 4.9%. And generally a vacancy rate between five and 7% is really where we're desired to see. And too low of a vacancy rate is indicative of a constrained housing supply. So I think that our vacancy rate shows that we generally do, we're, we're closer to five than we are to seven, especially recently. That shows that we have a lot of room to be building more housing to help put pressure on uh, rents in the county to keep them down and to keep that rent growth in line. Then, next slide, and that's it. You are almost exactly on budget. That was impressive. So thank you so much for, for that. Uh, really uh, impressive data, and we really appreciate the planning department's work here. Uh, now we're going to turn it over to our Office of Legislative Oversight uh, to give us an update on the rental survey data and some of the study work that you were undertaking as requested from the previous uh, Fed Committee uh, that uh, Councilmember Juando and I, along with Chair Reamer at the time, had requested. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Certainly. Uh, my name is Natalia Carzosa. I'm here with my colleague Stephanie Bryant, and I'm just here to give a very brief presentation on the project scope, status, and timeline for the upcoming 
OLO study on rent regulations. So first, just a little bit of background on the project. Um, as you mentioned, under the previous council, the Fed committee um, had a discussion on complaints about rent increases, and we were asked to uh, conduct a study on rent regulations in other jurisdictions and data on the Montgomery County rental market. So OLO has started work on this project, and our working title for the report is Rental Housing in Montgomery County and Rent Regulations in the United States. So uh, in terms of the scope of the project, it's threefold. First, we will have case studies on rent regulations implemented in other jurisdictions in Maryland and elsewhere, and that's going to include a discussion of complementary policies such as just cause eviction laws. Um, second, the report will include a summary of research on uh, the social and economic impacts of rent regulations, including uh, impacts on racial equity and social justice. And then finally, uh, we'll have an analysis of local data on the rental market. The primary source of this data will be uh, DHCA's rental survey, so that's referring to the annual survey that's done by the Department of Housing and Community Affairs of uh, landlords in Montgomery County. Um, we'll also consider DHCA complaint data and other sources, including Census Bureau and CoStar data, depending on what we're able to um, get from the DHCA data. And then this section will also include observations from local stakeholders. We're aware that there are a lot of things that we're not going to be able to see in, in the quantitative data, so we want to gather, um, we're working on gathering um, more qualitative data from stakeholders as well. So what's the status of our work? Um, at this time, we've received the raw rental survey data from DHCA, and we've started to um, work with it. And we have also uh, drafted a review of rent regulations in other jurisdictions. Many thanks to council fellow Logan Anbinder for his work on that. Um, we've reached out to local stakeholders as well to um, gather their observations and on the uh, on the rental market and the anticipated impacts of rent regulation. In terms of our timeline right now, we're anticipating that because of the time that it takes for us to gather feedback from stakeholders and complete all of our internal and external review processes, that project completion will probably coincide with the council's review of the FY24 operating budget. So this may be a report that the council wants to consider after um, budget. So that's pretty much uh, where we are in a nutshell, and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for that. We're going to reserve questions until the end of each panel. So I'm going to quickly turn uh, to uh, Mr. Desjardins uh, from uh, Council of Governments to uh, provide a presentation as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Paul Desjardins. I'm the director of the Department of Community Planning and Services for COG, the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. Very pleased to be here before you again. I was before the full council in March last year to talk about the state of the economy, and one of the things we focused on was the need for more housing. So I'm very pleased to see um, uh, the interest and in, uh, great interest, I should say, in this topic. Uh, next slide, please. So COG, we're a regional organization, and so I'm really going to enhance uh, much of what Lisa mentioned to you about the data for the county from a regional lens. But I want to start by setting the table from COG's perspective. We took this on as an imperative, that meaning the need for more housing in the region. We saw it as an economic development imperative, it makes the economy stronger. It does a better job of linking uh, land use, housing, and transportation together for our overburdened transportation system, and it gives us a better quality of life. We need more housing on so many different levels. Next slide, please. We took it one step further, though, and we actually quantified a shortfall at the regional scale. This actually came from some work originally led by the Transportation Planning Board. That top line is the gap, if you will, between the blue line, the amount of housing we were projecting through the year 2030, and then the orange line, what we determined was the actual need. And we arrived at that need by really trying to balance the number of housing units to fulfill the jobs and the workers that will be uh, fulfilling the jobs that are coming to the region going into the future. We determined, as you see there, we were about a 75,000 unit shortfall across the region on top of the 245 or so units that were being projected. The COG board leaned in. Next slide, please. And these were the targets that we set 
first, as a region as a whole, we should produce at least 320,000 total housing units by 2030. Again, 75,000 units on top of those that were already approved in the pipeline under construction. Again, a regional scale uh, for this need. Took it two steps further. That was the amount for accessibility. And I'll talk later uh, very much about this sort of spatial lens of where growth should be occurring. We said that 75% of all of that net new housing needs to essentially be near an activity center or high capacity transit station, places where all of the jurisdictions around the region have made tremendous fiscal investments to support our transit and transportation needs. And then lastly, that third target, the amount as a region, we unanimously agreed for the region as a whole, 75% of all net new housing should be affordable to low to moderate income households. And we define that as being up to about 120% of area median income. Next slide, please. So we took that one step further at our board leadership retreat uh, in the summer of 2019, and we had a conversation about what might that look like if there were, in fact, contributions to attain that additional 75,000 housing units. And what you see in the next slide, this is a bit complicated, but I'll walk you through. The first column is the amount of households in every jurisdiction in the year 2020. Second column is what that jurisdiction is projecting for the year 2030. And then the third column C is the growth increment, what jurisdictions are actually expecting to see during that 10 year period. The fourth column is the share of what that jurisdiction is contributing um, to the region's growth. So in the case of the District of Columbia, for example, you'd see the district was going to add 43,000 net new households. That's 18% of the region's total. So 18% of the region's share of net new households would be in that last column, 13,000 additional households on top of what was already being forecast. If you jump down to the fourth line, you'll see from Montgomery County, 391,000 growing to 422, or about 10% of the region's net new housing. And I'm very pleased that this council in 2019 took action to adopt that target of the additional 7,000 um, housing units as a goal to achieve on top of what was already being forecast for the county. Next slide, please. Oops, my apologies, this is interactive, Pam. You can go through that quickly. Thank you. Now, I'm an economist, so I'm gonna say on the one hand, but on the other hand. So to reach that 2030 goal, that top red line is what we would need to be producing as a region for 32,000 housing units per year. What you're looking at here is a chart that goes back uh, almost 25 years to the year 2000. You can see that tremendous drop off in permits being issued at the height of the Great Recession on the foreclosure crisis. We've crawled back up, and for the most recent year, 2022, you'll see a hair over 25,000 units being permitted, permits approved for uh, new construction. But as you can see, still well below that target that the region set. And so every year that we fail to achieve that 32,000 target, we are getting farther and farther behind. Next slide, please. Uh, you can click again, please. Lisa gave you a very good overview for the county using CoStar data. I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking from a regional perspective. We also uh, rely on CoStar data, both uh, we look at it for commercial construction, but I'm gonna focus largely on new uh, multifamily rental construction. And what you see in this chart is that's about uh, fifth, 22% of all the new construction in the region. So next slide, please. So here's the good news you'll see, and Lisa alluded to this, Multifamily housing has actually increased. We had that peak uh, around 2014 of a little over 16,000. It dropped off a bit. Um, the most recent year for which we uh, have actually compiled the data, we are working on the 2022 annual report. We compiled that data for all of our member jurisdictions at the individual project level, so it were a little bit uh, uh, behind waiting for the final, final data on those individual projects. But regardless, you can see uh, the trend is generally up um, and we peaked, or I'm sorry, we attained about uh, 13,000, just under 14,000 units uh, permitted last year in 2021. Next slide, please. This slide looks at an interesting lens on what type of buildings are actually being uh, constructed. So this is a function of the height, if you will. And what I'll call your attention to is that darker blue section of this surface chart. Again, going back to 1991, 
through the year 2021, and it's showing that the lion's share of net new multifamily is four to eight story mid-rise construction. Why is that important? It's a good density. It's a density that largely is has less, less pushback, if you will, that it's more easily embraced because it has that urban feel, but it's also, again, uh, there, there are benefits to, to it, both from the community's perspective as well as from the development perspective. Next slide, please. The corollary to this, and Lisa alluded to it, is the mix of the types of apartments that are being built. I call your attention to the blue and red portions of this surface chart. In the middle, the blue being one bedroom uh, units, which are the lion's share of the new units being produced. The red being uh, the two bedrooms, uh, the second largest cohort. As Lisa said, there has been demand. There have been studies, reports saying that there is demand for even larger units. But again, you run into challenges of cost and affordability uh, to go to a much bigger footprint in that case. Next slide, please. Lisa talked about this before. This is just a chart going back uh, to the year 2000, looking um, at inflation-adjusted dollars at asking, or rather effective rents, uh, across the different uh, product type for different uh, asking rents, if you will, for apartments um, throughout the metropolitan area. Next slide, please. I mentioned before that we spend a lot of time at the Council of Governments talking about spatial relationships, where is growth actually occurring, and so what you're looking at here in the beige are all of the multifamily rental units that were built prior to 2021. The red circles, and they're graduated circles based on the size of the individual projects, are the projects that were built during calendar year 2021. So the good news, as you can see, is much of that construction was in the core jurisdictions in and around the Capitol Beltway near Metro Rail stations. 75%, three-fourths, and I mentioned that target before, of wanting three-fourths of all the construction near Metro Rail stations, at least in 2021. We weren't quite at that level, uh, but you'll see 75% was actually inside the Capitol Beltway. So we are having focused net new construction, if you will. Next slide, please. This drills down a little bit more, talks about individual projects. Pleased to say that Bethesda, Noma, Alexandria are among the areas where some of the largest new uh, net new commercial, I'm sorry, rental uh, properties were built. But again, as you can see, we're focusing much of this construction along major roads and arterials, but not quite hitting the targets that we were uh, hoping to achieve before. Next slide, please. Now, this actually is the good news. 85% of all meti, metro, I'm sorry, 85% of all new multifamily units in 2021 were within uh, within one of the 141 activity centers or the 199 um, high capacity transit stations. I mentioned this before. Our target was 75%. In that particular year, we actually hit 85%. So we were actually exceeding that, exceeding that target. Again, you'll see Noma in the district near the Council of Government's offices actually captured the single largest um, net number of new rental units. Next slide, please. So I'm very pleased when you bring the long view to housing patterns and patterns of growth at the partnership the Council of Governments has been able to forge with um, Amazon, particularly with their Housing um, Equity Trust Fund. Um, again, you've seen and heard about that as a $2 billion fund um, across the country trying to invest in the strategic location of new properties for low and moderate income households in the markets where Amazon has a big presence. Next slide, please. A little, little over a year ago, we were very pleased to be awarded funds from the Housing uh, Equity Trust Fund. And what you see there is during the spring and summer of last year, we were able to uh, competitively award grants planning grants, if you will, to facilitate the planning and construction of new affordably priced housing near Metro Rail, near high capacity transit stations. We had 10 awards for a grand total of $650,000. Um, Amazon originally uh, proffered 500000 and the competition was so good, we went back and Amazon was willing to up the ante. And I'm very pleased to say um, we have actually secured funding for a second round of HAP grants that we'll be announcing details about later this spring. So again, would encourage um, anyone who is interested when that notice hits to, to apply. So next slide, please. Again, what we are trying to do around the region is to create places, great places for our families, for uh, those who will come behind us. Um, something that I touched briefly on at 
the, the briefing in uh, uh, March, is we are wrapping up a regional housing equity, uh, the, the first in, in 25 years, a fair housing choice plan. I'm very, very pleased uh, at that work. You'll be hearing more about that um, in the next few weeks. Next slide, please. Wrapping up very quickly, trying to be mindful of time. Um, again, we still need more housing in the region. We're doing better, but we really haven't completely moved the needle. We really haven't attained the goal that we want. Um, multifamily production is up, as I said. The mix of structures, the mix of unit types and affordability are continue to be a challenge throughout the region. The good news, again, is we're putting most of the net new multifamily housing in the right places, if you will. Um, but that, again, becomes a challenge because those are the most desirable markets. And so cost clearly becomes a challenge there. So I will stop there and happy to entertain any questions. And hope I was mindful of time. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate everybody's adherence to uh, the time. A very disciplined group, which we very much uh, appreciate. A couple of housekeeping items, speaking of... COG. We have the chair of COG in the room. Our uh, colleague, Kate Stewart, uh, is in the back. I think Councilmember Kristen Mink was also here uh, earlier, but had to step out to another uh, committee uh, conversation. So want to acknowledge uh, them being here with us. I'm also sitting next to the Region Forward Chair. Uh, who? So we are well, uh, in Montgomery County, so wanted to uh, acknowledge that. And I'll also note, uh, standing next to uh, 1983 circa, just like the median uh, age of uh, the uh, multifamily housing uh, in Montgomery County, also the literal age of uh, my colleague here. So uh, he said it was a good year. Uh, and so I'll, I'll let everyone make their own determinations. But I uh, appreciate that. I have a few questions. I'll open up to colleagues for uh, quick questions, and then we'll, we'll move on to future panels. But I just want to thank everybody, first of all, a, a hugely helpful presentation, I think, really setting the the framework. We, we talk a lot here about how uh, the, the plural of uh, anecdote isn't data, but every anecdote is somebody's story, and I think it's important that we have both. That's part of the purpose of today's conversation, so I really appreciate the, the baseline that you've provided. Uh, a couple items. One, um, appreciate you bring up the $2 billion uh, Amazon fund. Uh, we were able to see this at work, uh, both through uh, Amazon's efforts and through the uh, the uh, uh, more housing at Metro effort that this council put forward, Grosvenor Square, uh, is one of the first Montgomery County projects to benefit from this, uh, which helped to significantly increase the amount of affordable housing uh, at that uh, particular site, uh, which has increased uh, uh, significantly as a result of it. We're hoping to see more. I wanted to ask you, um, you mentioned the $650,000 in the 10 awards regionally. Uh, could you if you're able to explain uh, what of those, how much and how many uh, in Montgomery County specifically. My recollection, I'll have to give you the specifics later, but there were three awards in the county, as I recall, uh, for a total of about 125 to 150,000. Got it. Okay. Thank you uh, for that. We look forward to hearing more about the housing choice uh, program that you're doing. I know it's still in the early stages, but certainly our committee would like to be uh, briefed at the appropriate time once uh, that is ready, and so we will happily uh, invite you back uh, for that. Um, wanted to note uh, and just make sure I understood listening to, to the data. Uh, essentially, if you look at the housing production of, of new housing, we're about a third of the target for many years, and we're about now at two-thirds of the target, give or take, in recent years, but not near, you know, hitting or exceeding uh, the target. Is that a, about right, both Paul and Lisa, if you could both chime in? Sure. So I've looked at Montgomery County. Uh, there are pro building permit numbers, and I'm happy to share that with the committee. But yes, we are still under. We're, we're, we're getting there, but we're still under the We were dramatically of, underbuilding. We were dramatically New housing. Now we're, we're getting there. underbuilding, but not as dramatically underbuilding. But we still don't have enough new housing being built to meet the needs and to hit our targets. Yes. Is that I just want to make sure uh, we, we uh, uh, noted that, which uh, I appreciate. And then the uh, vacancy rate, I just wanted to do another you know, point of, of highlighting there. Uh, you want it to be between 5 and 7%. Closer to 5% means that there's a crunch. Right. Closer to 7% means that there is no crunch, that you have lots of available choices in housing or limited crunch, and we are steadily close to 5%. Right. 
I, I think it depends a lot on your market, but I think for Montgomery County and the trends we're seeing, it's certainly our vacancy rate certainly signals that we could be built. We need to be building more housing to help apply downward pressure on the rents. I think that, you know, I also want to, I didn't mention this, but vacancy rates are really important because you need a healthy vacancy rate for people to be able to do things like move and to offer things like concessions that can help lower the rent. You know, our concession rate last year was less than a percent. So that's just highlighting a pretty hot market that, that makes it harder for people. And by to a concession, move. you mean somebody saying, if you move in, we'll give you a month free rent, right. we'll provide you some other type of incentive, oftentimes financial, just to make sure yes. everybody watching understands. Okay. Uh, appreciate that. Um, and uh, just wanted to note one thing earlier from the uh, uh, OLO presentation, our budget process for everybody who's watching, the millions watching from home, uh, as uh, Councilmember Jawanda would say, uh, is it starts in mid-March, at least the operating budget does, and goes till you know, basically Memorial Day. Uh, we're required to pass a budget before the 1st of June. So I wanted to make sure when we said during budget season, we know what that means, but make sure everybody in the audience and, and watching uh, as it, uh, I know Councilman Jawando might have a couple questions, so I'll turn to him. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for coming to present and being so concise. Um, I guess this would be for you, Ms. Gavoni, uh, or the planning staff, but anyone can jump in. Do we look at rent growth trends uh, in other jurisdictions? You know, we see a trend here in the county that people move to Frederick or uh, up, you know, north of us uh, sometimes. Do we look at the rent? And, and, and kind of track that in any way. So I, th I think you're talking about people that move to other yes. jurisdictions. So there, we and, or just even tracking, because a lot of the, the the things you were comparing here were to northern Virginia, other jurisdictions, which I understand. But do we look within Maryland sure. in that way? So there's some migration data available by the IRS that we can certainly you know look at. Uh, I don't think. At least I don't look at it consistently, but someone in our research department might, so I can certainly check with them to see if they do. But there is limited available data, but it's, it's probably not as robust as we would like. Well, yeah, and even just, I would just think, it, when we have the charts of the various jurisdictions and rent growth, I'm just saying having those places where we know people are going, or at least are part of the market, especially now, you know, one of the things we talk about at COG is that, you know, with the way uh, remote working is happening, people can live right. farther. I think it, we just have to expand our our base of what's what means living in this region, Mr. Certainly, we can we can definitely do that. Okay, I appreciate that. And then, as far as do you have breakdowns on uh, rentals by housing type? Obviously, we have a very diverse rental market here in the county. Single everything from single family home rentals to large multifamily. Do we look at that as well, and what the various increase growth might be? Is that are we able to pull that out of the data? Yes, we can look at um, tenure by units and structure from the census data, and we can look far back to see how that that mm -hmm. has changed. I can certainly do that. Okay, just be curious to know if, where is where is it increasing, and also you know, going along with that, different parts of the county, which you kind of got into, uh, you know, which was helpful. Um, but I think the, as you know, I love your job because in your planning because you do a great job of this, but. I think knowing, just having a really good sense of where, what is happening, you know, what type of housing people are in, where they're seeing the most crunch, um, and, and any of those micro trends I think will be helpful for us as we're just trying to figure out and solve the issue. Uh, I think one thing that's clear, everyone up here agrees, myself included, that we need more housing. Um, the question is, and how many rental units do we have? A hundred, how many thousand? 133,000, right? It's renter households, we have 133 renter households. Right, so that times that times, if you did the average 2.5, right. you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer, not a mathematician, but you've got, you know, what is that, o over to 132, there's twice, it's 260 plus a little, 300,000 plus. I can get plus, you that number. Yeah, three, <laughs> 315 actual people, right? You right, know, or more, yes. give or take. Um, which I think is important, which would match up with the 35% of people who are renters. And we are a large county. You know, uh, every every classroom I go and I ask the kids, I say, how many people are in Montgomery County? You get everything from a 1,000 to a billion, and I tell them it's 1.1 million plus, and it was like, wow. And when you show the trends, and when you have the averages, I think we've got to be careful because average, we're, we're pretty in line. You know, the, the average rents, are right around reasonable rates. But when you have such a large percentage in a growing, increasing percentage of people who rent, uh, on the margins, even if you only have 
a small percentage of folks that are getting exorbitant rent increases, that can be a large amount of people. And I just think we have to remember that in our policies. Um, so I just, you can comment on that or not, but. No, I, I agree. I think, you know, I try to make that, that caveat when we were presenting the CoStar data that a lot of this speaks to averages and trends, but it really doesn't ex speak to the experience of, you know, every renter. I myself as a renter, and I can tell you my experience on a lot of these slides is very different than what the average shows, but I, I, I agree with you. It's, it's very important, and I, um, hopefully we, we've tried to pull out some of that newest nuance, but in the future we can definitely pull it out more. I appreciate it. No, you did a great job. It's hard. It's a big data set. Thank you. Thank can you, I make a, Can I just make yes. another suggestion that we can take a look at in order to get a more finer-grained uh, uh, look at this, you know, the planning department has our equity focus areas mapping tool, um, and so that is data that we can overlay with the housing data and see if that's another way that we can kind of unpack uh, some of these numbers. Uh, just uh, for those who may not be familiar with that tool, with this tool, it's on our website, MontgomeryPlanning.org, and it is a tool that we developed that's very similar to COG's um, equity emphasis areas uh, that we tailored for the county that looks at. Uh, the uh, num uh, percentage of residents who are people of color, low income, and speak English less than very well. And so we have that map on, on our website, but it is a, a, a layer that we do use for other purposes, for our plans, and, and for other uses. So that's something else that we could take a look at to try to get some more of this data. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks. Um, uh, uh, a couple follow-ups on, on that, and then I'm going to turn uh, to uh, my other colleague here. Um, one is... Or you earlier when we were had the demographic presentation, uh, Chair Zients mentioned the the rent burden challenge at the higher end. That uh, if somebody is downsizing who has potentially wealth but not necessarily income, they might show up in the data as rent burdened, but it's a very different type of rent burden in terms of lived experience than somebody at the lower end of the income strata and is there a way you know for instance if you're on a fixed income you make you know limited income you could have a really expensive rent but you also just sold your house that you had significant equity in. that's a very different experience than than, than somebody else in, in a lot of the data that we're talking about is there a way to disaggregate the data to see that that's that's been a, sh a struggle I think shares science is you know correctly right that wealth doesn't show up in an in income necessarily I don't, the census doesn't really aggregate that, that data. There's some like national data and some state data about wealth, but I don't know of anything that we could really get to like the nuanced tract or even county level, but I can certainly do some. Perhaps as a proxy, if we could take out the highest rents out of the data, which is not a perfect proxy, but could potentially give you know some uh, idea and at least give some thought uh, to that, I think it'd be helpful for us to understand if they're uh, was was uh, a way to look at it, and I'd also like to do a deeper dive subsequent to this into the inflation-adjusted slide, which I thought was a really instructive slide, and I also think uh, the point that you made that I'd like to have further conversation about uh, related to Bethesda specifically about supply and how adding supply you know, had a material impact on uh, the pressures of uh, rents. I think that's something that we need to uh, discuss, as you heard from Councilmember Jawando. There's widespread agreement that we need more housing. We hear that from uh, the, you know, the COG report. We hear that from the planning report. Uh, we all share that view, and I think it would be helpful to see that in data. Uh, but with that, I want to turn to uh, Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. Thank you for the presentation. Um, what I got out of all this is that we must build more housing, but especially housing that is targeting deeply like building more deeply affordable housing, I think last week or two weeks ago at this point, we had a perfect example in Randolph Hills, and now you're going to be speaking, so I'm not going to talk about it, but I, I'm still very excited about your project, and I'm looking at you over there. Um, I, I didn't hear much of a conversation about income, the fact that people are not making enough money to live in Montgomery County. Uh, just last week, we had the planning department in front of us talking about the demogra demographics in, in the county. And we saw how uh, many of the jobs that have been added have been jobs that pay like thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year. That's nothing. You know, that's so little. So talking about making sure that we grow job base in Montgomery County, it's, it's equally important when we talk about housing. 
uh, making sure that people make a living wage to live here. Um, so that's key, and making sure that we do everything we can not to displace communities. So my question is for you, Natalia. I love your name, by the way. <laughs> uh, close to Natalie. Not as cool as Natalie, but good enough. <laughs> Uh, the rental survey data that you're talking about for your OLO report. Um, so you mentioned that, so you're trying to get data from the HCA about rent increases, I guess. Like how, do you, how can you make sure that you're getting data from landlords, that like they're giving you the real data to complete this report? That's what I'm still wondering. Sure. So um, this is a, a survey that um, is required by the county code that the uh, DHCA does every year, and they um, they survey landlords. So it does come from landlords. Um, what if they don't do it? Like, if, what if they skip it and they say no? So uh, I know that the county code does have a um, a fine that they can that they can impose, um, and then. Um, DHCA, uh, we've spoken with them about kind of uh, what they've been doing in terms of linking it to rental licenses. So um, what we have heard um, from DHCA is that the data, uh, they're getting a pretty good response for um, the parts of the county, most of the county, but within the municipalities uh, of Gaithersburg and Rockville, it's a little bit more difficult because the county doesn't have the same level of oversight in terms of um, in terms of uh, how they the the um, their role in terms of overseeing rental properties. So you know there was a rally outside this building right before we came in, and uh, one of the speakers who I don't know if she's still here, una de las doñas que están aquí hablando, one of the ladies who was speaking from Gaithersburg, um, she was sharing her really terrible case of how she's being displaced, but she's from, with, she lives within the city of Gaithersburg. So I'm interested in knowing how we can work in collaboration with the city of Gaithersburg. I know we have the forever mayor uh, of Gaithersburg in, as part of the county council. Maybe he can help out. Um, and, uh, yeah, that too. And uh, Rockville too. Uh, because if we don't have the, I'm, I'm a numbers person. Numbers do not lie. If I don't see the data, if the data is not reliable, then the report is going to be not very good looking so um so that's my concern so when you were talking about the fees how do you make sure that um that the county is actually using their legal power to ensure that we're getting as much data as possible is that, that that's a great question and that's one of the things that we did want to um discuss with dhca as part of this report but um, okay. we're still you know, in the process of, of working on it, so we don't have an answer for you right okay. now. Okay, that's good. To, yeah, I know they're gonna be here later, so I'll ask them, but since she was here, talking about Olo, I have to say that. Um, you know, I'm just gonna leave it there, and uh, looking forward to the next panel. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I just wanna note, these presentations, as well as all the presentations from today, will be posted on the council website as part of this staff packet, as an addendum to this staff packet, so everybody will be able to see uh, all the different presentations and perspectives uh, that are shared today. Not everybody has a, a PowerPoint, but most of the speakers do, and they will all be publicly posted. So with that and with our appreciation, thank you for joining us. We're going to call our second panel up here, and we the panel did a great job staying on time. Us council members asked extra questions, uh, which were great, and it was a good conversation, but we're running a little bit behind schedule here, so we're trying to catch back up. Uh, the second panel is on the economics of affordable housing. And this is perspectives from nonprofit and public providers. Uh, we have Chelsea Andrews, the executive director uh, of HOC, uh, with Zach Marks, the chief real estate officer uh, at HOC, Housing Opportunities Commission. Uh, we have Paul Bernard, CEO of AHC. Uh, we have Robert Goldman, uh, who is president of Montgomery Housing Partnership. So if uh, each of you can uh, join us and... Um, We'll get started with the Housing Opportunities Commission. I would appreciate you uh, joining us and welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Council Member 
Fene uh, Gonzalez and Councilmember Jawando. Thank you for affording HOC an opportunity to share the work that is currently underway at HOC to preserve and produce affordable housing in Montgomery County and to provide our recommendations on how to advance our shared mission of ensuring that all residents have a place to call home in Montgomery County. I am Chelsea Andrews, the Executive Director of Housing Opportunities Commission of Montgomery County, and I'm joined with my colleague, um, Zachary Marks, our Chief Real Estate Officer. Next slide. We'd like to start by providing um, background information about Housing Opportunities Commission and the work that we do to provide housing and empower the residents we serve. HLC is a dynamic, quasi-independent organization providing a full spectrum of resources to support extremely low, low and moderate income families. Our services range from providing housing and case management support to individuals experiencing homelessness, to being the largest developer of affordable housing, to providing financing tools to support the development of affordable housing, as well as ensuring that families in our um, county have the ability to be first-time home buyers. This slide shows how we do our work as a public housing authority. We administer federal and locally funded rental assistance program and provide resources to clients related to family self-sufficiency, financial and credit counseling. We have a renowned fatherhood initiative, workforce development, entrepreneurial support, a lot of resources that we provide to our clients. As the housing finance agency for the county, we issue bonds that support the development of multifamily and single family homes and mortgage um, closing cost assistance to moderate income families. As the owner and operator of nearly 9,000 units in the county, our goal is to ensure that our residents reside in homes that are well maintained, our families are supported and located near transit and have a wide variety of amenities. And as the public developer, we are proud to produce high quality, innovative, environmentally forward and transient oriented mixed income housing across the county. Our team, our real estate team, which is led by Zachary Marks, currently has 13 developments in progress that represent approximately 3,300 units. And um, we are also proud of the economic impact of those developments, nearing close to 900 million in construction costs. We are led by seven board of commissioners who are appointed by the county executive and confirmed by the council. Next slide. To ground our discussion on the need for affordable housing, it's imperative that we do so through the lens of understanding who we are serving and where our disparities exist. Next slide. Thank you. It comes as no surprise to this council that HLC's clients, those with less means across the county, reflect an overrepresentation of black and brown people. While the county population of black people is 18%, HLC serves 59% African American clients. That's three times more than our county's population. Next slide. The age range for the families we serve reflect the fact that we have a higher number of children in our households as well, and compared to the county average. As you can see, the Montgomery County population is at 23% for children, 18 and under in our community and for our residents, there are 32% of um, families with children 18 and under. Next slide. We also see an overrepresentation of females in our families. Over 61% of our families are um, led by families, excuse me, by women. Next slide. And this uh, slide allows us to have a good opportunity to pause and understand the disparities as it pertains to income levels. Um, as our county uh, area median income is approximately 113,000, you can see across the board that our various programs, um, that our families are far below that average. Next slide. We provide rental assistance, next slide, to nearly 8,400 households. 
um, through the federally funded Housing Choice Voucher Program, which supports a third of individuals who are elderly, a third of individuals with disabilities. We have an extensive waiting list. And so as we talk about the need for additional affordable housing in this county, um, this is where we see that show up. Over 37,000 people are on our waiting list and it takes over six and a half years to um, make your way to the top. Even with the support of a voucher, almost 20% of our residents are rent burdened. So next slide. This slide just allows you to have an opportunity to see where our families with vouchers are able to utilize those vouchers across the county. It also shows what um, and where our families are not able to utilize vouchers based on payment standards and or access to rental properties. Next slide. I will turn it over to Zachary Marks, our Chief Real Estate Officer, to share more about the work we do in developing and preserving affordable housing. Thank you, Director Andrews. Um, good afternoon, Council Members. Um, so from a development perspective, um, HOC is uh, one of the largest owners by unit count in, uh, of any uh, public or private owner in the, in the county. And you can see that we have um, pretty significant uh, dispersion across the county. Um, HOC looks to serve wherever the need is. Um, obviously, there's a concentration around um, the more densely uh, the dense employment areas and the dense population areas focusing on transit, but, um, but we're also um, looking to serve with um, certain co development communities in other areas um, like Sandy Spring and Clarksburg um, as that need arises. Next slide. Um, one of the things that we really felt uh, that the Council of Government's information did well is that oftentimes when we're trying to get a project done or we're looking at a program, um, it's often um, a very, very small part of uh, what needs to be the solution. And one of the things that the Council of Governments uh, goals did well is, is to actually name, name the problem and, and talk about the size of the problem and to actually indicate, um, you know, what, how many units did we actually need. Um, and so we've, uh, as we've begun to um, create additional strategies and tools to, to deliver on affordable housing, we've uh, we've begun starting with the actual problem itself. And so from a preservation standpoint, as much as some of our new construction um, sometimes grabs the headlines, um, HOC is very focused on preservation and reinvestment in existing properties. And, um, and so one of the things that, that caught our eye from, a, from another planning, you know, another great planning report, uh, was an actual calculation of, the, um, of those naturally occurring affordable housing units that are not restricted and as such are uh, vulnerable uh, to redevelopment um, and and so uh, what we see here is that in fact we have a number and that number is uh, as of 2020 26,000 naturally occurring unrestricted affordable housing units that could go away at any time next slide um, following on some of the earlier really good discussions um, uh, what we see here is is the uh, the county's um, the, the, the county's tracking the, of the, the tracking of the county's COG goals, and as we can see, that other than other than in 2019, um, we're still not um, you know we're still not hitting that 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 33 3400 units a year that we need we need to get in terms of the goal we set back in 2019. Next slide. And so one of the one of the strategies that HSC and the council have worked on over the last few years was the housing production fund with the idea that. The private sector is really doing what the private sector can do, right? They're 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 maximizing their business model to deliver what they're delivering, and and that's what's yielding this sh shortfall. And so the idea in creating the housing production fund, as an example of a tool that um, can actually create net new housing, does not compete with some of the the finite affordable housing resources, and that empowers HOC to do more of its existing business model. It's, it's, it's a 30-year-old model of mixed-income housing that the council said, hey, we like that. Can you do more? How can we do more? And one answer happened to be the housing production fund. And as you can see in this graph, the um, I think it's orange. I'm colorblind. I'm sorry. Um, you can see that HOC, beginning in about 2016, you can see some of the participation in, that, in the actual deliveries by HOC. And the fact that you can actually see it on a graph is 
is pretty significant for a public housing authority. And from 22 on, that actually assumes we're hitting our, our goals every year. And so you can see that because of the Housing Production Fund, HOC is becoming a greater and greater participant in delivering housing. And by and large, these are developments that are not going to use those finite resources like low-income housing tax credits and so forth. And so, um, so it's, it's nice to be able to start from a problem and begin to propose tools and solutions that, that appear to be working and appear to be working well enough that they, you know, you can see them from 30 feet away on a screen. Uh, next slide, sorry. Okay, and so we wanted to share our thoughts in regards to how do we close the gap. And we um, believe that the approach that we need to take as a county is threefold. One, we need to preserve um, more rental assistance and provide, excuse me, we need to provide rental assistance to our um, clients and to our residents um, by way of both federal, state, and or local subsidy. And we can do that by way of creating additional shallow subsidies and or a similar um, program mirroring what uh, the federal government does, but it would allow us to touch more families across the county. We need to preserve the existing affordable housing as we've discussed and as Zachary outlined. Um, and we are in the process of exploring additional ways to do that um, by way of creating additional funding sources, potentially um, mirroring how we're approaching our um, housing production fund that has been a great success. And we need to continue to produce additional housing. And so it's a three-prong approach. Um, we need to make sure that we're providing by way of a subsidy. We need to preserve what we currently have and we need to produce more um, and I will turn it over to Zachary to just share a few highlights on some of the projects that we currently have underway thank you and in the interest of time and catching catching up on some of it um, uh, just I'll use these projects as an opportunity to highlight some of the very different ways in which HOC can be a tool to this county and is a tool to this county in in, in reaching its goals and so on the, the top, you see the Laureate, which is at the Shady Grove Metro, so in terms of transit-oriented, um, um, high-quality, mixed-income housing, this is it. It's opening in, um, in about 30 to 45 days for its first residence. This is actually the first deal to be funded by the Housing Production Fund. And, um, and so this is exactly what the fund was intended to, to do, and uh, very fortunately, we were able to get um, we were able to, to join with, um, with EYA and Bazuto on this to, to, to bring it to market faster because of the work they had already done. Um, but this is, uh, this, is, this is what we meant by the Housing Production Fund, and as you'll see, there's, there's more to come. Um, on the other side uh, is Elizabeth Square, which some of the highlights there are the, in terms of the, the power of co-location when the county and HSC work together to deliver um, you know, a significant public asset in terms of the recreation and aquatic center that'll be underneath. Uh, this is also opening in the next, uh, the, the uh, residential will be open in the next bunch of weeks and, um, and the uh, recreation aquatics center soon to follow. And so this was a, a very powerful co-location opportunity for the county and for HSC. Next slide, please. Um, Hill and Dale Gateway, uh, you'll actually, you may have noticed that the, the buildings that were there have actually disappeared and that you'll actually see dirt starting to move um, uh, in the next couple of months. Um, this is the second uh, housing production fund uh, deal. This will um, dramatically change the entrance to the, to the county on the east side. Um, and this will also be, both, both of these buildings will be built to passive house standards and the senior uh, the senior building, we're actually targeting zero net energy, and so both of these would be the first in terms of multifamily within uh, the state, and in some cases even further beyond the state. Um, but once again, um, the Housing Production Fund uh, in action. Um, not to miss the opportunity to talk about renovations, which um, frankly makes up um, almost as much of that $900 million in construction that um, that, that Director Andrews highlighted earlier, that we, we do a significant amount of reinvestment in our own portfolio. Um, and the Metropolitan, of course, was once a Class A new construction project that HOC was involved in. And so you can see the importance of HOC's permanent owner, you know, near permanent ownership of everything it has, where uh, we're around 30 years later to reinvest in, in, in these properties to make sure that they can continue to serve. Next slide. Um, and then, um, 
and, and then with Heritage Emory Grove, I think many are familiar with that project, but this is another another opportunity and a different way in which the county and HSC are working together um, to take um, to take uh, stock of a, of the impact of um, of urban renewal back in the 1960s and 70s on what had been uh, a thriving uh, historically African American community, and so HSC is able to play a role. In in, um, in Heritage Emory Grove that goes far beyond housing, uh, so yet again it's just another versatile way in which HSC is able to serve communities, serve the council, serve the county, uh, and then Wheaton Gateway is really the the 2.0 of Hillendale, and I don't want to shortchange Hillendale. It's a, it, we're very excited about that too, but Wheaton Gateway is really um, already utilizing some of the lessons that we've learned on Hillendale Gateway um, to deliver. Um, uh, there are about 800 units in in three phases on Wheaton Gateway, so um, and that's that will also be a, a housing production fund um, a funded deal. Um, and then last uh, and uh, least in terms of units, but um, maybe first in your hearts. So we have uh, we've also uh, tried to put together a little bit of a pilot project around Missing Middle that should break ground this year. Um, and our goal here was yet again for HSC to try to simply, rather than to, um, you know, to let let others discuss hypotheticals, but to actually put something on the ground and and, and see see if we could deliver housing in a way that um, that is completely consistent with the surrounding communities, and does something important. Um, it actually puts one and two bedroom rental units in Sandy Spring, as you might imagine, in places like Sandy Spring, there are really only single family homes, and so. Um, even if you are a renter, your options are generally three or four bedroom homes, and so this is an opportunity to provide some diversity of units in sort of a counterintuitive way. I think that's it. Yes. It's not it. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I just want to highlight in Fenton Silver Spring, the Breakfast Club is, uh, is now open. Um, very, very exciting. Uh, yeah. So in terms of uh, economic development and uh, whether or not HSC's presence brightens communities, I think we can safely say the, you know, when we have this kind of buy-in from uh, small business owners, um, restaurants, and so forth, uh, we get excited about that. And the residences on the lane opened back uh, earlier in 22, um, and uh, and this is actually the uh, 150 senior units wrapped around um, a new multifamily building in downtown Rockville. Mm -hmm. And, and this is it. This is not all that we have going on, but this is all that we've included in this presentation. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. All right, now we're going to turn it over to Paul Bernard, CEO of AHC. We normally see Alan Goldstein here, who's also he is here. Uh, in the audience, which we uh, appreciate, but uh, really uh, appreciate that you brought the boss uh, today. Uh, so we really appreciate that, and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, good afternoon, Honorable Council, and um, thank you for including AHC in this very important and vital conversation. Um, as you can see, we don't have slides, but what I'd like to do is to share, you know, our comments and, and, and impressions regarding the topic. Uh, we'll start off you know, first about the role of nonprofits and affordable housing. Um, you've heard a lot, and I'll leverage a lot of what's been said, especially by Lisa and Paul. Talk a little bit about who we are and how we show up in Montgomery County, and then last talk directly about the, 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 the economics of affordable housing and why it's so challenging. So you've heard already um, the notion of, of from, of from HUD that you know, if you pay in more than 30% of your income for housing, then you're burdened. Um, if you're paying more than 50%, then you're severely burdened. And um, here in Montgomery County, at least based upon some of the reports that we read, you're at 40% of your renters spend more than 35% of their income on housing. That translates into about 53,000 know, households. If you look at the HUD definition at 30%, you know, it raises it up to another 65,000. Um, households that are rent burdened. And as we know, and as you heard from our previous uh, presenters, that housing burden levels in the concentration are indirectly or move indirectly to income ranges. So what that means is the poorer you are, the worse you are, right? You now most would conclude that this is the raison d'etre for you know, nonprofits uh, providing affordable housing. You know, helping people at the lower end gain access to um, you know, decent, safe, and affordable housing. And I would agree. But is that the only reason that we exist? 
Um, does the role of affordable housing nonprofits extend beyond just the social and, and equity benefits? Now imagine for a second um, the dollar impact of reducing or eliminating that rent burden for those you know, 53 to 65,000 households uh, on, my, on the Montgomery County economy. Um, perhaps it might lead to increases in disposable income, um, greater local investment, additional growth, stability, or even better economic resilience. To me, this is another reason that nonprofit exist in the housing space, to support economic growth through the development of, and I'll use the term, well-balanced um, and optimized housing markets. So my name is Paul Bernard, as, as I mentioned earlier. I'm the president and CEO of AHC. It's a nonprofit developer of affordable housing and a platform for resident services in the DMV. Uh, we have 54 resident communities, uh, 8,200 units, and 700 units currently under construction. In Montgomery County, we have seven residential communities comprising 1,520 units. Um, and our resident, so resident services platform supported 315 residents, 218 units, with programming about 1,300 times in Montgomery County in 2022. Uh, most recently, uh, we broke ground um, in, in from the Randolph Road community. Now, this will be a it's right. This will be a 195 unit mixed income, deeply affordable project, uh, which includes both rental and home ownership in partnership with Habitat for Humanity. Um, going back to me, I have a background in, in real estate finance, urban planning, affordable housing, and community development, and I've worked in the private sector, public sector, as well as the nonprofit sector. Now, lastly, what I'd like to do is focus in on the question around um, sort of the economics of affordable housing. Um, when I think about the economics of affordable housing, I think about two things. The first I sort of alluded to, housing, especially affordable housing, should be viewed as critical infrastructure for economic development. And then number two, affordable housing development is most impactful when viewed as a platform for transformation and connected to the community and to the region, thus the importance of integrating uh, resident services. Um, the economic challenges and social challenges at AHC are too dissimilar from other nonprofits in the space. I mean, we have issues with access and cost of land, access and cost of appropriate equity and debt capital vehicles, of course, the rising cost of construction. If you look at the Randolph Road project, which we had um, anticipated would be around $350,000 per unit, uh, by the time we actually got into the project and scoped it a couple of years later, uh, those costs rose to about $500,000 a unit. Um, cost of inflation, um, interest rates, interest rates, the cost of the construction went rose 20%, Interest, interest levels rose by 2%. Um, the supply chain delays, COVID overhang, eviction pressures, um, regulatory compliance and issues and, um, that, that impact our speed of execution and any uh, myriad of social and political um, influences. So in essence, um, we believe what we do as nonprofits in the affordable housing space is translate your public policy into action. Um, and we do that in cooperation with our public and private partners. And in cooperation with our public and private partners, we believe our, you know, the, 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 I would say the challenge of the affordable housing industry is how do you stretch those very constrained rental revenue streams through creativity and through um, layered subsidies. Um, without Montgomery County's release of land or subsidy support, the Randolph Road Project would not have been possible. And as I mentioned earlier, from the planning to the groundbreaking, hard costs rose more than 20%, and the interest rate environment increased by 2%. Now, in terms of our recent success, I probably know two projects, certainly the Randolph Road Project and the Waterfront Project in Washington, D.C., where we um, partnered with a for-profit luxury apartment developer to provide a third of the 400-plus units um, as deeply affordable or affordable. So I would say what we used in both those instances was, you know, creativity and innovation. We were extremely aligned with the public sector and had excellent partnerships and a solid public purpose. So in closing, let me just say this. Uh, the economics of affordable housing, it is tough. 
and it's a constrained real estate business. Um, it's like the Marines who run that Marine Corps marathon in full gear, combat boots, bearing the American flag. Uh, it's difficult, but doable. Um, and when done right, the benefits are both mission and business fulfilling. So thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. I'll note uh, Habitat for Humanity, your partner uh, on the Bushy Drive uh, project. They're going to be joining us for a subsequent conversation that's yet to be scheduled, focused specifically on home ownership and home ownership programs today. We're just focused on rental housing, and since they focus on uh, on uh, home ownership uh, programs. Uh, they're not with us uh, today, but I did want, want to note that we discussed their participation, but uh, ultimately decided it'd be best uh, that they uh, come for a, for a future and if, and discussion. Say, uh, we were, we're going to take that model um, it, that we use here in Montgomery County, combining rental as well as home ownership. We're going to take that in all the jurisdictions where we build housing in the DMV. Appreciate that and appreciate your partnership with them and with the county and the state. I uh, would like to turn it over to uh, Rob Goldman, President of Montgomery Housing, Housing Partnership, to talk further about uh, his organization and the broader landscape of nonprofit housing providers as somebody who has been working this space for quite some time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. And as you said, my name is Robert Goldman, President of Montgomery Housing Partnership. And MHP has been around since 1989. Our mission is to develop quality, affordable housing. And it, we, we not only are building and developing quality housing in the county, but we are also, our mission is to uh, empower the families that live our, at our properties through an extensive array of what we call community life programs and to strengthen any neighborhoods around where affordable housing is located. Appreciate uh, the opportunity and thank you for holding this hearing and uh, to ask us to, to sort of talk about successes and challenges in developing affordable rental housing uh, in the nonprofit community. Uh, in terms of recent successes, MHP this last year acquired three properties allowing us to preserve over 600 units of affordable housing. All three properties were at risk of being uh, lost to the county's rental housing stock, affordable rental stock, especially Rollingwood Apartments, a 285 unit building within walking distance to the Purple Line and Earl Manor, a 140-unit building within walking distance to the Wheaton Metro. Uh, the county's funding for housing preservation and its new uh, pilot policies played a major role in our ability to and help to facilitate these acquisitions. Uh, MHP also closed on financing and will be breaking ground shortly on the Forest Glen uh, development, redeveloping a 72-unit development into an 188 unit affordable housing development within walking distance to the Forest Glen Metro. And I will recognize that COG uh, talked about those grants and we were one of the recipients uh, for that project. Uh, we're also working on two exciting new developments near the White Flint Metro and uh, the Wheaton Metro. These projects and others in our pipeline represent about 1,500 units of affordable housing. And when you look at MHP's pipeline and, and the work of other nonprofits. I mean, I think it's clear we can say that there's just a great need to finally issue the $50 million bond for nonprofit affordable housing uh, developments. I thought I'd get that in there, uh, Council Member. Um, our uh, Forest Glen uh, development costs over $4 million to get financing to the closing. And that is, you know, a lot. Um, sorry, second. Oops. I'm oh, sorry, I got all uh, excited. I skipped the line here. I got all excited here. So in, uh, it, you know, in terms of our challenges, I think one of the big challenges I think we have uh, in terms of trying to finance these deals is really the, the need for pre-development funds. And so as I was saying, the Forest Glen development costs over $4 million to get to closing. And you know, that's a lot to ask for nonprofits to put at risk when there are limited returns on those investments. Um, the state has some limited funds for pre-development, and we're currently working to expand that program and could use the county's help in elevating uh, that issue. Also, the county only provides very limited pre-development funding only for projects on county land. And years ago, the county did much more to provide pre-development funding, and it would go, in my opinion, a long way to support um, the nonprofit community in developing uh, affordable housing. Uh, you know, the other, you know, the next challenge I would talk about is, you know, 
is really about on the resident side. The payment of rent continues to be a problem since the pandemic, creating difficult situations for residents and for affordable housing providers and owners of uh, small apartments. At the end of each month, we still see about 17 to 18% of uh, families not able to pay their rent. And while this is down a bit from the height of the pandemic, it is still uh, very high. Uh, in 2022, uh, we did some looking at our demographics. We saw that the average tenant incomes rose about 11%, but this is mostly the result of tenants who were uh, unemployed or underemployed getting uh, jobs back. Uh, at the same time, we've seen also seen about 15% of our residents who face more substantial declines in income, and we still have a number of residents who haven't found a job since losing it due to the pandemic. The pandemic will have a long-term impact on low-income households. With rental assistance is sort of coming to an end, uh, the court system is beginning to catch up on cases, and so it's my opinion that the Montgomery County should see a sharp rise in evictions over the next six months unless some type of rental assistance is provided. There is a great need for targeted rental assistance for residents who are still under, unemployed or of limited income. And what's greatly needed, is, in my opinion, is to pair the rental assistance with job counselors. MHP on, you know, has been paying, uh, has paid to provide job counselors for our residents to get and have had great success. And it's something I think the county should really uh, take the lead on and. Uh, do some and expand what, what, what they may already be doing. What we have found throughout the pandemic is that bringing services to where people live has had the most direct impact on families' lives. In terms of kind of development, I think one of the challenges, and um, uh, AHC uh, made some reference to that, construction costs. We've seen construction costs rise anywhere from 20 to 30 percent over the last couple of years. Supply chain issues have been a real problem, although we're beginning to see that ease a bit. So for some items where we have to, uh, we have to order some items six to 12 months before we even close on our financing. So it will be there at the construction site when we're ready to start. These include appliances, cabinets, electrical gears, and much more. So for a 100 unit deal, a construction cost increase May, could uh, these increases may have added four to six million dollars uh, to the development. You've spent all this time getting your financing together, all of a sudden you have this big increase and you have a huge gap. Interest rate increases, you know, we've seen it anywhere from two to three percent increases since 2020. I was looking at a recent deal, 97 unit deal we did, for every one percent increase in the interest rate, it created about a 1.3 million dollar gap in permanent financing. Um, and, uh, and so in addition to, I would say, in addition to kind of the great need for the HIF funding to help fill these gaps, uh, one thing we could do uh, at the county is to advocate to the state. They have certain caps on funding levels and it's, it's time for them to kind of increase those caps uh, to provide more gap funding uh, for these projects. Um, yeah, uh, I'll say the other, on the expense side, um, I will say uh, some of the things that are driving expenses are payroll costs, cost of maintenance supplies, utilities, license fees, and insurance. And as we look to the future with recent uh, legislation passed by the uh, county, nonprofits will need to figure out how to comply with electrification and BEP standards. These are important climate change bills, and we urge the county to develop funding to support, you know, affordable housing owners' ability to invest in these changes to our systems and to our buildings. But I'll just conclude by saying that, you know, the work that the council has done, like through the pilot bill and your investment in the HIF, has really resulted in some amazing successes over the last uh, few years. And so you really should be proud that, you know, you, you pass a policy and it results in change, right? And so those are great things. Uh, and I think also the council should be applauded on its efforts uh, to um, provide uh, rental assistance. Um, despite these successes, you know, the challenges persist as the impact of the pandemic, pandemic has not sub, uh, subsided completely as new challenges, um, you know, have, you know, in the aftermath of the pandemic. So I thank you for holding this hearing. I, I urge you to continue 
your commitment to affordable housing. There's a lot we can achieve, and I appreciate your interest in this. Thank you so much. I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Councilmember uh, Natalie Fanny Gonzalez. I have a few questions, but I'll chime in after her. Thank you. Very quick, straight to the point. Um, I have to say the Randolph uh, Road project is highly sustainable, so thank you for doing that too. I just wanted to plug that in. Um, I love, Robert, that you mentioned what I was, what I mentioned before, the need of talking about income and making sure people make more money to live here and working on workforce development. Uh, I chair the Economic Development Committee for the Council, and that's one of my main focus uh, to ensure that, that our community have the tools, especially Latinos and African Americans uh, have the, the skills needed to get into, uh, to make more money and stay in our county, so that's critical. Um, I've been looking at the state, uh, state legislation, um, bills that actually um, help us get more money for rental assistance, as you're saying. I think that should be a big focus for everybody, especially making sure that not just the county, but at the state level and federal level, we uh, pro provide more funds to people in need so they can stay where they live. That should be, no, at least for me, that's number one. And I was looking at the, uh, there's a bill by Delegate Von Stewart, uh, my delegate in District 19, is HB 0060. Uh, the county council is not, I think not, we haven't talked about it. I personally endorse it. It uh, establishes the housing innovation pilot program. Uh, it's basically to, to work on, uh, to give money to local groups for redevelopment projects, which is exactly what you guys are talking about. So that's something that I'm looking at. Um, I want to hear from you all what kind of policies you don't want Montgomery County to look into because you could affect um, redevelopment or, or for you guys to invest in Montgomery County or continue to invest in Montgomery County. You see what I mean? Anybody. Because you all talk about things that we should be doing, that's great. But I also feel that I need to hear what kind of things we should not be doing. I think that's important in that conversation. That's a heavy question, I guess. <laughs> we can leave it to the next panel. Uh, I mean, the only thing I'll say, and I made reference to it here, I think there there's times when the council has great policy that they want to achieve because there's a great need, right? Air conditioner bill, window guards, they're all great bills. But then the question is, how do we, and BEPS and electrification, they're all important bills and we're all for it. So, but I think the, what's lost though is, okay, not only how do we do that policy, but how do we do it in a way that makes it work for affordable housing and works for affordable housing owners and providers. And I think that piece gets lost, right? We, we do the important part, which we address the, the, the need, and we're all for that, but we don't get to the other side of it on, well, how do we then implement this in a way that works for the people, for affordable housing owners? Because the the for-profit owners, the market rate owners, they're gonna, that's part of their 9% increase that you saw last year, right? They built that in and they can do that. We can't, right? And so, so we need to figure out some funding mechanisms or other ways so that we can achieve that in a way that makes sense. And, and so we're, I think, I, to the T, like it's part of our MHA discussions, we're all for these bills. We're not against them in any way and they're addressing important needs. I think we just wanna have that other conversation about, okay, how do we get them done in a way that makes sense? And if I could just jump in there real quick, um, more generally, uh, time is a killer. And so um, anytime one produces a new set of policies or new sets of regulations, uh, being able to synchronize that with other rules and regulations is extremely important. Um, we noticed during Randolph Road, at least you know, during our, you know, our celebration, folks were mentioning how long it took. And so the longer it takes, the more expensive it is. And, and the longer you are in terms of delivering that product, that end product to the residents. And so I would say that as new rules, regulations, or, or programs come up, being able to synchronize, synchronize the compliance and regulatory um, issues is, is really important. Ms. Andrews? 
Yeah, I, I think in addition to what was stated, just kind of taking it all the way down to even when you're providing resources to um, residents, thinking about what that burden may look like for them to apply for those resources, to gain access to those resources. We've had trouble getting money out of the door because of some of the high burden in terms of additional documents and redundancies um, that it takes in order for people to participate in programs. So thinking really about how you can streamline everything from uh, how our residents uh, obtain access to resources to how our developers are able to provide um, and develop additional affordable housing or housing across the county. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Uh, just a couple notes. One, I'm glad you brought up uh, House Bill 60. Uh, Delegate Stewart has put forward HOC uh, was in their presentation as well. Something that's important, a one-for-one -one match for our efforts that would help us to supercharge the supercharging that we're trying to put into many of these projects, both with HIF funding, the creation of the Housing Production Fund, the Naturally Occurring Affordable Housing Program that we uh, funded, uh, that the county executive has proposed, that actually has seen its first project occur that we'll hear uh, about uh, in a subsequent uh, meeting uh, from, from this one, uh, but certainly would help. And I noted both uh, uh, presentations noted the cap at the state. I think uh, HOC said it could be $125 million in bonding yes. capacity, but there are real challenges from state restrictions that uh, we need to work with the Moore Miller administration on. We think we have a partner uh, in the Moore Miller administration that will focus on housing. Uh, many of us have uh, strong relationships not only with the uh, administration uh, in Annapolis, but also uh, the new housing secretary, uh, former mayor of Salisbury, Jake Day, did a lot of uh, work uh, in Salisbury. So, uh, you know, I'm excited uh, about that opportunity. I think all of us are excited about that opportunity, but there's uh, more work that needs to be done in order to address some of these issues and as much information as you can provide for us of things that would be helpful, uh, I think uh, would, would help. Uh, on the $50 million fund, I hear you. Uh, trust me, nobody wants to do that more than I do. I've been advocating for it uh, for a couple of years. We have to work out how uh, we can do it, but I think there's a model for us to replicate what we did, the $100 million fund, which is now being replicated in jurisdictions around the country, which is really exciting. Uh, with Montgomery County as a model. Um, I'm proud of the fact that the prior iteration of this committee really worked hard uh, on that, um, and I think we have an opportunity to, to replicate that for uh, our nonprofit providers as we always envisioned and, and, and still uh, continue to hope for. And I think that there is an opportunity to look specifically at pre-development funds. In many ways, the Housing Production Fund is a pre-development you know, construction loan program uh, to eliminate those upfront cost risks in order to allow for private funding to occur so that we don't rely too heavily on limited public resources like low-income housing tax credits, like the Housing Initiative Fund long-term financing vehicles, which is in competition in many ways uh, with both of your organizations and many other uh, nonprofit uh, organizations. So uh, important for us to be talking about it here. I think it's something that we'll be uh, moving forward with and, and, and looking into uh, further, we also want to look into the time uh, that it takes. We appropriate funds. It takes about 14 months, we learned, uh, in order to close deals, uh, to actually get financing out the door. And so if we have a 12-month appropriation timeline for a fiscal year and it takes 14 months to cut a deal, we need to be pre-authorizing funding so that deals can be made so the, the money can actually be utilized uh, to address affordable housing. So that's something that we are actively working on and trying to, to work through uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, the uh, executive branch. So I just wanted to, to, to note that uh, as well. My um, two, two main questions, one's a broad-based question uh, for, for all of you. Um, are there any projects that you work on that are subsidized affordable housing projects that occur without any public subsidy, federal, state, and or county. Do you do projects that are exclusively private? Um, I'm going to ask uh, Zachary to give some comments about the Lindley and the project that we had um, there. But as it pertains to current projects undergoing, the answer to that is no. But we have some demonstrated su success in that way. Yeah, so the, the Lindley is the, was the redevelopment of Chevy Chase Lake Apartments uh, down just off Connecticut, and um, that, was, uh, that was a transaction where the commission, um, commission itself uh, 
donated the land into the property or contributed the land to the property, not donated, but, um, and it was, um, and we basically used, um, so we created a somewhat similar to Randolph Road in which there was a for sale portion and there was then uh, the Lindley, which is 200 units. And so we used the sale of a portion of the land for uh, the for sale to actually fund um, to fund HSC's portion of the construction equity in that project. And then uh, we partnered with the K. Fritz Foundation out of D.C., nonprofit foundation out of D.C., to the other half. And so that was actually, then that won a, a Jack Kemp Award. Um, so a hugely successful program. Also has three bedrooms and some real successes right on a future Purple Line stop. But the public subsidy was the land. Right. right. I mean, I mean so insofar you, you as HSC had to be that public subsidy, there was. Right. Public. So there was a public subsidy, which was the land, but right. fortunately because of the land, uh, limited. So no other examples of something that would require no public yeah, we, subsidy? We, we have a unique, we've been around since 1975, and we have a couple of projects in our portfolio that are sort of market-based projects. Um, I think Alan might be able to reference what those are specifically. No, you got the people who are watching need to be able to hear you briefly. Thank you, thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you, Bob. Got to hit. You have to hit the button. There you go. Okay. A AHC was one of the original founding members of something called the Housing Partnership Equity Trust. It was a congregation of large-scale affordable developers who put their capital together, partnered with large banks looking for Community Reinvestment Act uh, acknowledgement and taking below market rate returns. So in partnership, those two equity groups were able to combine with market rate debt and acquire assets throughout the nation. Uh, the most specific example here would be the Birches mm -hmm. in White Oak. We acquired a 228 unit community and Andrew, to your point about the tiers of financing, we did not utilize federal tax credits, we did not touch state resources or bonds, nor did we reach into the, the HIF. Now there are going to be an opportunity to recapitalize the asset and make it long-term committed affordable, but that would be one of two examples. Others we did in Fairfax County in partnership with a for-profit development group where again we combined equity and our own mission orientation, in this case with local subordinate debt, uh, to be able to execute in a way that was very, very lean and efficient from a public subsidy investment. But there's some public subsidy, just in very the latter, limited. Not in the former. Got it. Okay. Helpful. Um, yeah, we have uh, two examples. One, uh, we similar thing. The subs. If you want to say there's no no subsidy dollars, but we did uh, read uh, develop only Springs 104 unit uh, development that was county owned land and it was for sale uh, community. And you know, in a sense, the county took less than market value for the land, which allowed us to have 30 percent of the units at. Uh, affordable uh, and 30% at workforce levels. We also, this is a technicality, but uh, we did acquire the um, Rollingwood uh, Apartments. Uh, it did, um, you know, again, the subsidy, it was private subsidy in the sense of uh, Amazon invested $28 million. The county will put in at a later date $1 million from their uh, investment fund, but the uh, National Housing Trust uh, from their own funds uh, put in that million for now. So it will have a little small amount, but the, again, the, the, what made it work was an investment, you know, the $28 million sort of below market investment from uh, Amazon. Appreciate that. The, the, the latter, the county was subsidizing it through a disposition at below market rate in order to secure higher levels of affordability, which is a common practice that the county does with the disposition of public land. But again, the county is putting in land for cheaper than right, right. So yeah. the taxpayers are yeah, yeah. providing so that's you what something I'm for yeah, less. Yeah, yeah. there okay. was a Got land it. subsidy, but not a dollar subsidy. Yes. Yeah. Got it. I think it's helpful to the conversation yeah. to understand that we're subsidizing Absolutely. virtually every single one of these projects, which we should be, and I'm happy that we are. But I think it's an important part. A question: I think anybody who's watching this, the big takeaway is 37,000 people on the wait list for HOC. Can we just talk briefly about how we address a wait list that takes six and a half years? That's 37,000 people long of those who are in clear need of housing in the county and what we can do to address that? 
Absolutely, and in fact, I think we could have a whole work session on it. Um, you know, we're in the process of gearing up for our five-year strategic planning process, which will allow us an opportunity to do an even deeper dig and dive on those individuals who are on our waiting list so that we could understand better what their specific needs are. Um, I do believe that once we look at the data, we will see that there are some families who might benefit from a shallow subsidy, which would allow us to eliminate individuals from the waiting list. Um, we also have to better understand what and where our residents who are on this list are interested in living. Um, there are individuals who, even if we have a unit available, would rather wait on the list for a voucher. We only have a limited amount of federal vouchers. And so if, again, this goes to the point that I was raising earlier about the fact that we need to think about how can we provide um, subsidy now in addition to producing and in addition to preserving. because individuals enjoy the ability to have the flexibility to live wherever they'd like to across this county and we only have a set amount of vouchers and so as we go through this process of looking at the data I think we'll be better informed in the very near future on how we can address that waiting list um, and how and what we need to do in terms of resources um, to get to a more comfortable um, turnaround time. We're going to schedule another work session both to talk about the 37,000 six and a half year wait list and then also what interventions we can provide for those who are on the wait list. You know, both solve the problem but then address the people who are impacted by the problem in the meantime because, I mean, six and a half years of a wait list is totally unacceptable. I know we all agree on that but you know we need to have a separate subsequent specific conversation just on that so i just want to but note that if, for if i could just add a second and, and so highlight what um chelsea just said the i think the takeaway for me from the pandemic and the need for rental assistance it's no longer about rental assistance because you were impacted by covid it's about people who are low income that need a rental assistance and if we're going to do that some type of shallow assistance of like $200 a month is greatly needed and, and maybe it's not the full voucher but it's some rental assistance mm -hmm. and we can get away from were you impacted by COVID? We all were impacted by COVID. Let's get people rental assistance. That's what's needed and that's the conversation I think we need to have with the state and whoever else because that's greatly needed. And we're going to have a separate conversation specifically to talk about this and we'll hear from DHCA and HHS later about the county's rental assistance programs, but this particular issue requires a standalone conversation. If I may, I do want to make sure I make this comment, and that is if you are on our waiting list, you can have access to the resources we provide our residents. So anyone who is watching, there are financial literacy coaching um, sessions, workshops, one-on-one, -on -one, credit counseling. Our goal is to help our um, People, our residents who are on the list not need to even be on the list and so we provide all of those resources to anyone who is on our waiting list and you can go on our website at www.hocmc.org to obtain access to um, that information. Appreciate that. Thank Council you. Joanna. Thank you and I'll be rapid fire. Um, good to see you. Uh, Ms. Andrews, I haven't met you in person and hope, look forward to talking. As I always say, my father lived in Tanglewood at HOC property for more than 20 years uh, and was a beneficiary of, of your program. And you guys, you guys do great work. I'm glad to hear the, uh, that you've been using the production fund well, too. So look forward to that. Um, when people, just something to put on our list for the next hearing, we hear from residents who have a voucher. You know, there's too many people waiting, mm -hmm. but they have a voucher, but then they're discriminated against and they're not able to use the voucher which obviously is even, they're both bad, but one gives you hope and then it gets pulled away. What's the enforcement mechanism and how, how can we get better at that? You can, I don't want to, that's a whole another session too, but that's a problem that we need to address and I want to dig in that with you all and with all the appropriate folks. Yeah, let, because that could be a very long conversation. Yeah, I so think, I'm, I'm gonna say no, let, don't answer now. Yeah, but thanks it out for the there. marker yeah. and let's include that as a substantive part of that follow-up yeah. conversation where we specifically talk about that issue. Thanks yeah, for raising it. Absolutely. Uh, MHP has about 1,100 units. I'm trying to get uh, a sense of yep, the... Yep, 2,800. 2,800, okay. Yep, growing. What's the sense of, what's the nonprofit? what's the whole pie 
of nonprofit affordable housing in the county. Do you have a sense of that? Oh, how many total that? units? Yeah, I, I couldn't couldn't tell okay. you that. Yeah, uh, just staff. Let's just I want to let's try to figure that out. I just think we want to again know the pie. Yeah, we could uh, talk to like MHA and see if we do a survey. Figure out. You know. Yeah. Again, mm -hmm. like we do, we want to have the goals. We want to know where we are. How how you all fit fit into it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing I'd say just to HOC or any of you can comment on this is the last question I have. How. Uh, how are you dealing with rental increases? Mm -hmm. We actually follow the voluntary rent guidelines for all of our properties. Um, and of course, our residents who have vouchers, however, are often impacted by rent increases. Mm -hmm. And so within that first year, we would only allow for a tenant to go up to 40% of their income. But after a year, they can, um, if they want to stay in their home, agree to higher rent prices. And so it's really the properties that we own um, and where we're the landlord that we're able to secure and ensure the affordability. And also, of course, the um, units that we're producing through the Housing Production Fund also benefit from the voluntary rent guidelines um, that is set out by the county. Appreciate that. Yes. Seth, I mean, Matt, Matt I'm sorry, <laughs> or whoever. Do you do the similar thing? Do you hold? We, 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 we follow the guidelines as well. Okay. Um, we follow the guidelines as well. And in most instances, we come in lower than, than those guidelines, the board approved guidelines. Yeah. And I know you have to, but I'm just, I think it's important to say, to have the answer be heard for the yeah, millions I mean, watching at home. Yeah. We, we have, you know, similar, we have agreements with the county. So we have to keep, uh, you know, the rents down to a certain level. And, and we, whatever those agreements say, we follow, um, you know, and that's just the way. Okay. And, and the other piece to note is that the, the programs, like the affordable, and, and this is one of those things, the federal program, you know, if you're doing tax credit, most of these are tax credit deals. They have limitations on what the maximum rent can be and dictates sort of what the rent increases can be as well. Okay. And so, you know, when we say it's 60 percent, it's not, you know, of area median income. It's not just that the resident is at 60 percent. But the rent is calculated using the 30% formula. You're only spending 30% of your income on rent, so you, so it's it's kept at a specific level, and we have to keep those rents at a, a certain maximum and can't yeah. exceed those. And important for the stability. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Really appreciate this panel. We're going to call up our third panel: the economics of, uh, uh, or excuse me. Um, yeah, the economics of housing perspectives from for-profit. Uh, providers. We have Doug Furstenberg, principal at Stonebridge Real Estate, Evan Goldman, executive vice president of development and acquisitions at EYA, Gabrielle Duval, executive vice president and general counsel of Southern Management Companies, and Dean Hunter, CEO of the Multifamily Owners Association. Uh, and as soon as you're up, uh, Furstenberg will let you start. Go ahead. Uh, for the record, Doug Furstenberg with Stonebridge. Uh, thank you. Uh, Committee Chair Friedson, Council Member Joando, and Founder Gonzalez, welcome. Um, I'm going to, if you could just go to the next slide, I'm not going to spend time on the challenge. I think that's been well laid out by um, all of the, I don't know if the, can the slides be seen? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's been well laid out, but the we as an industry realize we have to be a partner in solving this. And I think you'll hear a lot of ideas about how we want to be able to work with you. Uh, I'm going to focus in on some math, if that's okay. So one of the things we, we want, to, want to figure out, and we've done it in the district as well, is what can rent support? So if I'm, one of the things we start looking at is what covers operating expenses and what we call dynamic real estate taxes. So lower real estate taxes on a unit because the rents are lower. So if in a high-rise building you want to cover those operating expenses and real estate taxes, it's 36% of AMI. If you want to do it in a garden unit, it's 33%. So if you're targeting someone in the 30% to 40% AMI, you have to create an entirely free unit. There's no capital available to create the unit. You, you can just cover the cost of operations, maintenance, and real estate taxes. So that's, that's an important marker. 70% um, AMI is you know, for high-rise or MPDU rates. Um, I use that instead of doing 75 and 65. How much in a high-rise does the MPD rate contribute to the actual development of the high-rise unit? Less than 25%. So the developers are subsidizing, which is part of our math, at 15% MPDUs, we're losing, we're subsidizing 75% of a high-rise unit to do that. In a garden apartment, 
we're subsidizing two-thirds of it. So lots of subsidies going on. When we talk about market rent growth, and I have a lot more slides, but trying to stick to the four minutes and 39 seconds that uh, the chairman said I had. Um, we asked Delta Associates, which is a big research group here, to do a lot of different slicing. We're happy to share more of it with you. What we wanted to look at was, and this is Class A, the Class B is pretty close. Gabriel's going to talk about uh, their naturally occurring workforce housing. But if you look at it over the last five years, so trying to smooth our time through the pandemic and where we've come through in 22. AMI has grown by 5.2%. CPI has grown by 3.8%. Montgomery County rents have grown by 3.3% in Class A. In Class B, it's grown by 2.8% cumulatively. So I think as we look at this, while the charts as shown earlier show a lot of up and down, it shows we're actually not keeping up with CPI as landlords. And our costs have gone up on development costs, which we'll, Evan will talk a bit about later. Costs have gone up by much more than CPI. I want to take a long look. So you look at 20 years, AMI has grown by 2.2% to uh, Natalie's comment, I mean, we, we have an income issue here. We've got to figure out how to grow, wish, grow income because there has been a gap in the county between AMI over the last 20 years and where rent growth has been. So while 2.2 to 2.9 doesn't sound like a lot, it is over 20 years. So we realize how we do that, how we're smart, how we look at that is really important. But I think all these numbers show that, that, that we're, we're not overperforming in the real estate sector if you look at where our rents are to CPI. <laughs> Next chart. What drives our business? It's capital. And for almost all of us in Montgomery County, 80% of our capital to build our projects come from sources that are not in Montgomery County. Lenders, equity investors, the like. So for them, they're just looking for, they're agnostic as to where they invest. They want to get their returns. So we have to prove to them that we're a good place to invest. That's how we're going to achieve the growth that everyone seems to agree we have to achieve. If you look at us, take that chart I just showed you on the prior page, and now compare that to other markets, and we just kind of pick random markets in the southeast to compare ourselves to, our rent growth has been anemic, which is why I've seen two things going on in our business. One, a lot of our brethren are, no, are not just focused in the D.C. area anymore. They've gone outside the market and a lot of them have gone south. And so we have to figure out how to stay competitive. What do we want to do? What policies are we going to put in place to make that work? Next slide, please. So when we look at policies, and I heard it on a prior panel, we need to merge policies with the math. The math is going to tell us what's going to work. And we want to do it all housing types, but every housing type will require a different kind of math. Smart growth is the key to addressing and funding the affordability. So what are some of the ideas that we want to make sure we preserve? We've heard it before, but it's really important. Preservation of affordable units through the purchase of projects with restrictions is far more cost effective than developing a unit. Two projects to point to, one, the exchange of Wheaton, high rise Safeway project sold for $275,000 a door. That, that project's probably double that to create today. Compare it to Randolph Road, the new project, which is wood frame, low rise. So how do we do that? And how do we do smart development on some of our older naturally occurring so we don't lose what's there, but we encourage them to develop? So what does that mean? That means the county has to use its tools. It's got to use all of them. And it's going to really have to look at its rental assistance programs because I found a quote, uh, if you go to the next slide, from an NYU study that I thought really hit home. A more efficient way to ensure that low-income households receive the benefits of rent regulation is to pair broad-based anti-gouging rent regulation with target subsidies that reduce housing costs for low-income tenants. That to me is a model by which we can really figure out how to bring the cost of housing down, why we're focused on production. So I speak on behalf of myself, but also our colleagues in the audience here in the real estate industry. We want to partner with the county, we want to find the solutions, and we want to make sure that people who are rent challenged are no longer rent challenged. Thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer some questions or go on for another five or ten minutes, but you didn't say, you said we, I shouldn't, we, so We I won't. appreciate it. Thanks for helping us get back on track. We have Evan Goldman uh, from EYA. Thank you so much. Um, Pam, I just have one slide. Um, 
I, I kept it short. Um, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, to the committee, thanks for allowing us to speak. We really appreciate it and pre appreciate being invited to this forum. Um, my name is Evan Goldman. I'm Executive Vice President of Acquisitions and Development for EYA. Um, Doug, that was a fantastic uh, lead-in to this conversation, and I'm going to focus on the development side of the business um, in addition. Um, and what, a little bit on the positive side, I'll kind of highlight some of the things the county is doing right as models that you guys should be continuing or even increasing, quite frankly. Um, and part of that is because the we can preserve as much housing as we want. It's great. Um, but if we really want to get at the issue and if we really want to start solving some of the backlog that HSC has, we also have to build, um, just realistically. Not just market rate housing, but we have to be building affordable housing too. So this one slide, it's my only slide I'm going to present, has six examples of different projects we've done creatively where we've created not just um, affordable housing you're typically used to seeing in the MPDU program, but higher percentages of affordable housing mixed within market rate housing, which we believe is kind of the best way to create housing um, for all. The first project you already heard a little bit about from HOC, that's the Laureate um, up in Shady Grove. And um, they went through a little bit of how that project made sense. But just to give you the numbers, it was thir it's 30% affordable. So that's 80 affordable housing units being generated out of 260. It was public land, so we had a discounted land price. It used to, as you all know, it used to be owned by the county. Housing Production, production Trust Fund um, capital. It was HOC as a partner, so it's tax abatement because they're a public entity. Um, HSC floated bonds for that building. And so all four of those tools went into the toolbox in order to create a project that's 30% affordable. Um, next example to the right of it, the Lindley, also uh, mentioned a little bit earlier by HSC, also a project we did in partnership with HSC. Uh, this is in Chevy Chase, one of the wealthiest parts of the region. 40% affordable, um, half of that, 40, 40 of them at workforce level, 40 at MPDU level or below. Um, the subsidies in this case was the private land transaction that you heard where EYA put a contract to buy townhome ground and in return um, HOC ultimately used that equity to subsidize the, the high rise apartment, apartment building. But what's important to note there too is if it weren't for HOC's ability to use their line of credit to put the capital in to build the new units first, you would have had to tear down the existing units in order for EYA to close on land, provide the equity to then build the building. So it's important to make sure we're funding those gaps uh, so that even whether HSC is a partner or not, we can come up with creative ways to redevelop housing at a denser level with more affordable housing units. Um, that was also public um, public land, HSC obviously, so there was subsidy there. And on top of that, HSC doesn't have to pay taxes, so that building also has a huge tax um, benefit, or t doesn't pay taxes essentially. Um, the Daily Shady Grove, so the predecessor to the Laureate in the same neighborhood, 23% affordable versus the 30% at the Laureate, 77 affordable units generated, a public land deal. So the only subsidy in this case was that it was uh, public land, but this was built in 2015 versus 2020. So you're seeing the difference in construction costs and how that's impacting the ability to finance affordable housing just over five short years. Um, in the case of the daily, we could build 23% affordable with just the land um, discount. That same land discount, when we came time to, to, do the, to do the Laureate, we also needed the Housing Production Trust Fund. We also needed the tax abatement from HOC. Um, so you can just see how it's getting harder and harder to build. Other examples in the region, the three on the bottom are projects in Old Town, Alexandria, and Washington, D.C. They're on a slightly sl uh, lower scale in that they're uh, mixed income townhome communities. Um, but we did those also in partnerships with housing authorities, D.C., as well as um, Alexandria. In those cases, um, we had low-income housing tax credits, which were critical to making them work, and they provided projects that were 34 to 60 percent affordable, depending on the individual project. Um, some of many of which had units well below 30 percent or 30 percent AMI and lower, I should say, because they were um, they were re um, replacing low-income housing. Um, nine percent tax credits there were critical, and our partnership with those housing authorities in order to get those nine percent tax credits were really critical. So all of these projects had major uh, public assistance. New partnerships, um, we're looking in D.C., quite frankly. We have two, um, or I should say D.C. as a district, is getting very aggressive and starting to see results. Uh, the first is a tax abatement that they've offered. Um, if you do 33% affordable housing in your project, you get a 99, uh, up to a 99-year tax abatement. Um, and they've started to see, uh, they've seen numerous applications for it. The program is oversubscribed in its first year, and they'll be increasing the amount of uh, tax abatements that they're going to be granting. We've applied, and we'll hopefully be using that for our 410-unit building at the Tacoma Metro. And so you'd end up with you know, over well over 100 affordable units in that project right at Metro. Um, they've also created a $500 million in housing fund for direct investments in affordable housing. 
something we always encourage the county to increase. Um, and then they do public-private partnerships where they redevelop their old housing stock of affordable units or market rate affordable units into uh, redevelopments. We're doing Greenleaf Gardens with the Housing Authority where we will be taking 493 low-income housing units, increasing it to a total of 1,493 units on the same site, so an additional 1,000 units, three times the density. In the end, the project will be 46% affordable, um, and 493 of the 600 affordable units will be low income, uh, 200 will be moderate income. So a heavily subsidized project where the city will be making a direct investment in addition to the free land, and on top of that, um, major, major amounts of affordable housing. Um, from a construction cost perspective, one of the things that's working against us in the, in the industry right now, we've kind of partnered and talked to many of our partners in the audience who are building projects now and have been building them recently. Um, we can share details of this with you in another forum or later. But the long and short of it is, in the last eight years, essentially hard costs have doubled. And so that's what's the struggle, right? How do you, how do you build the same amount of housing? How do you build affordable housing when costs have gone up so much? Um, and then the second piece, which Doug really hit on wonderfully, is the lack of market rate rent growth. So if your costs are going up and you're not getting increases relative to the region in market rate rent growth, there is no way to subsidize that affordable housing. It's, you can barely subsidize the 12.5% that's required, let alone additional. And that's where the county's role comes in. So our recommendation is um, all of our Montgomery County affordable housing projects or mixed income housing projects have one thing in common, that's HOC. So um, they're an incredible partner. They need to be supersized. They need as many barriers removed as possible for them to produce housing. Um, and they need to be able to partner with as many people as possible to get that housing produced in a way, in the way, in, with the tools that they have in their toolkit. Um, but they can't do it all. So we also need the county to do, do other things. And the recommendations would be direct grants to projects. If you want a project to be 18% affordable housing instead of 15 or 18 instead of 12 and a half, let's do the math. Make a direct investment, right? There's ways to close that gap so that project can move forward. Um, bridge capital for creative deals like the one we talked about at the Lindley, um, larger housing production trust fund, lobbying at the state and federal level so that not only does, does Maryland start getting more tax credits that people can go after, all the housing developers, but also more importantly that Montgomery County starts getting its fair share of those dollars. Um, right now a lot of times they go to other parts of the state. And then um, tax incentives in return for increased affordable housing. The DC bill, the 33% um, affordable housing in return for the tax uh, essentially zero taxes is a huge incentive and that's something the county could take advantage of as well. So in closing, um, the development community is not the problem but we can be the solution um, and in the past I know there's been um, assumptions that the private sector doesn't want a lot of affordable housing in our buildings or all these rumors that you hear and it's really not true. Um, the, la the first thing you want quite frankly is a project where you can lease up 33 percent of your units in a month um, and so we absolutely love having affordable housing units in the buildings. It's quite frankly fantastic for from a societal perspective, and it's what we need to be doing. Um, but we can't do it alone. And so there needs to be a, a figure out a way to make sure that the capital that's needed to create those projects um, is there, or quite frankly, none of them will be financeable, and we won't get the supply of market rate or affordable housing units. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, appreciate it. Gabrielle Duval from Southern Management Corporation. Thank you. Um, just couldn't wait for my slides to come up for a moment. Um, while we're doing that, let me just say, um, Chair Friedson, committee members Jawando and Fanny Gonzalez, we are so grateful for the opportunity, for the fact that you're bringing together a really diverse group of stakeholders. We do believe that this is a holistic problem that needs a holistic solution, and we all have to share in that together. So we're grateful for the opportunity today. Um, next slide, please. So my name is Gabrielle Duval. I'm with Southern Management Companies. Southern Management Companies are long-term operators. That's a big difference. We have managed and maintained all the apartment communities we originally acquired since 1965. And that is an important distinction because we're here to stay and how we look at our investments are on a longer-term basis. Our portfolio information of our 4,400 apartment homes in Montgomery County, 3,251 of them are under 60% AMI. An additional 241 apartment units are less than 65% AMI. So we are a significant provider of naturally occurring workforce housing in this county, and we are proud participants to do so. What you'll note is workforce housing is really below market in terms of rent increases. Our entire portfolio from our Class A in Montgomery County through our workforce housing, over five years, we only saw an average rent increase of 1.09%. So the rents, uh, we have to ask ourselves, what problem are we solving for here? And to me, it's very clear. I've listened to a lot of voices today, done a lot of research. 
The problem is housing affordability and access to apartments that are affordable for our renters and create good, great places to live. The problem is not year over year increases. So we need to look at housing differently. We want to be part of the practical solution, but I'm going to go to a question that committee member Fanny Gonzalez asked the last panel, which is what wouldn't work? And I'm going to speak to that. And what doesn't work is rent stabilization, which is neither practical nor a real solution to the problem we're having in this county. If we can go to the next slide. Thank you. There are four main problems with rent stabilization. Housing disinvestment, loss of tax revenue, housing deterioration, and gentrification. Next slide, please. In three major metropolitan areas, there have been many successful studies explaining the failure of rent control or rent stabilization in those jurisdictions. In Boston, Massachusetts, upon the immediate repeal of rent stabilization, they saw a 12% increase in valuation of those rent stabilized process, properties almost immediately after the repeal. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because our properties are all financed and our financiers and our investors are looking at those data points. And valuation and loan to value ratio are critical components of that. Our lender for our largest sector of our portfolio recently advised me that if we had rent, more rent controlled assets in our portfolio, we would not likely have access to things like interest only loans or um, mission driven favorable loan terms that are what we look to to kind of keep our properties going. In San Francisco, California, when they introduced rent control, what happened was a little bit of market play. And those folks owning those rent controlled units took them off the market, converted them to condos, tenancy and common projects, and redevelopment. It created a dearth of housing that skyrocketed existing housing stock in San Francisco. And most recently, as I'm sure you're familiar, in St. Paul, Minnesota, there in 2021, they passed rent stabilization, which is in the process of being repealed starting in 2022. Why? Because prior to rent stabilization, they averaged 1,391 building permits for new multifamily projects a year. Post rent stabilization, it was down to less than 200. So if we're looking to add housing stock, to add incentive, to add investment into the county, rent stabilization is a deterrent to those issues. Next slide, please. We have our own case study, and I would like to share this with you in the interest of being honest and transparent. Last year, Southern Management looked at our workforce housing and said, we want to develop and continue to create um, better communities in our, within our community. We don't want to tear down. We don't want to rebuild. We just want to add. And we had a lot of surface parking in which we could do that. We looked at two communities, one with Summit Hills. Next slide, please in downtown Silver Spring. It's an amazing asset with a ton of land and opportunity. And Summit Hills, by the way, is all workforce housing. And it's under 60% AMI in total for that community, which includes three beds, townhomes. It's a beautiful community. We had an opportunity there to build for sale market rate townhomes and a new multifamily building. We had the same opportunity at a project across the river in Fairfax and Arlington counties, and we chose the latter in large part because of the prospective rent control that's being talked about in Montgomery County. As long-term holders, we can't rely on the exceptions most rent stabilization bills have of one, two, five years for new build because we're holding our assets for 30 and 40 and 50 years. So it really is, when we talk about housing disinvestment, it's not an empty threat, it's not a hammer, it's very real to how we're looking at our investments and the dollars we would love to put into this county. Um, we would welcome the opportunity to work with HOC and other groups to figure out how, what to do with this because we have so much land and we want to use it for good in the county, but we need to feel that the county is a stable place for us to continue to invest. Next slide, please. The loss of tax revenue is very important to the county and very real. There was a Towson University study along with BPPC um, commissioned in 2015. That study found that if you took a hypothetical passage of rent control in Montgomery County at CPI plus in 2015 and extrapolated that out over 10 years, the county would be at risk to lose over $538 million in tax revenue strictly from rent control. They also predicted a loss of 70,000 jobs due to rent control because we, diff we service and manage our rent controlled assets differently. And um, Council Member Fanny Gonzalez, that goes to the very important point about creating income driven opportunities. Next slide, please. We have to be honest about what rent control does. And one of the things it does, and it's the fact of being a housing provider, 
is it housing providers typically allow properties to deteriorate a little bit down to where the rent control price becomes the market price for that asset. We want to provide people in this county the absolute best place they can afford to live. We want them to stay in this county. We don't want them in a deteriorated housing stock. That's not what's best for the county and the future of our residents. Next slide, please. Finally, we have to talk about gentrification when we talk about rent control. As Southern management, most of our housing product is older, which costs much more to maintain. As we look at those costly maintenance and operating costs and the cost of employing the folks we need to run our buildings effectively, we have to look at, it. does it become in a rent controlled environment cheaper and more effective to tear that down and build new class A? And even if you hypothetically build new class A with 15% of MPDUs, what we're doing is we're creating very high rental units, 15% affordable, and we lose the workforce housing. It is so important that our teachers, our medical staff, our people who work in the county can afford naturally occurring housing in the county, and we must preserve that housing stock. Next slide, please. So we have to find solutions to work together. I am not saying no solution and no limitations on rent, right? We all support a robust anti-rent gouging bill. And that bill would prohibit the bad actors, the anecdotal stories you're hearing about, the people who are raising you know, rents 15 to 30% for no reason other than because they can. They, that's not who's sitting here, and we don't want to be a part of that. We want to be part of that solution. There need to be reasonable exemptions for that, such as new construction, capital investments, high operating expenditures for our workforce housing. And as the gentleman for, um, mentioned on the last panel, Mr. Goldman, we need to consider also exemptions for county and state legislated mandatory investments like BEPS and sprinklering. And finally, we support what the previous panel mentioned, subsidies for renters. It's really about what this county can commit to, where we can use our budget dollars, and how we can help our existing renters stay here. And in closing, I will just say that we look forward to working with everybody who's spoken today with the council to make Montgomery County an attractive and affordable place to live, work, and stay. Thank you. Thank you, and Dean Hunter. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. You wanna, my name is Dean Hunter. I'm the CEO of the Small Multifamily and Rental Owners Association. We're a trade group representing the interests of small rental property owners in the greater Washington area. I wanna thank you and, and uh, commend you for holding this hearing today and for inviting us. Uh, and I'll be very brief. I want to make three major points. Uh, the first point is that small landlords play an oversized role in the rental housing ecosystem. Um, you've heard testimony today from your Office of Planning that approximately 25% of rental housing is provided by individuals who rent out a house, a townhouse, a condo, or a single family home. I submit the number arguably could be higher. Uh, I'm a commercial real estate broker and a property manager, and I was able to generate um, a list of some 54,000 uh, single-family homes, condos, and townhouses in the county that were uh, non-owner occupied. Um, we could assume that um, the overwhelming majority, if not all of those 50-some thousand non-owner occupied homes are rented out. Small landlords play an oversized role in the, in the, in the provision of rental housing, um, not only with the single-family homes, but also the multifamily buildings. I was able to identify some 1,500 about 1,400, 1,500, 1,450 uh, multifamily properties in the county. Of those, 700 were 25 units or less. 25 units or less. These are small buildings. They're walk-ups. They uh, don't have elevators. Again, these are properties that are owned by individuals. Um, the problem becomes that the government regulates all landlords the same. You regulate that individual who rents out that townhouse or that small um, that single family home, the same as the Washington Real Estate Investment Trust, and it doesn't work. Um, you know, the small landlords are relying on this income, and it's, it's, it's very little to supplement. You have retirees who supplement their retirement income. You have individuals who work for the government and other places who just rent out a, a, a house and use that income to supplement their income. It puts food on the table, it pays college tuition. So, I want to again commend you for having me here because many people don't even acknowledge the fact that small housing providers play such a crucial role in the housing ecosystem. Secondly, uh, one of the reasons small providers are so important because it's the largest source of naturally occurring affordable rental housing. Small landlords, uh, they know their tenants. Uh, they're renting to individuals who, 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 are, who are in uh, in those houses, in those condos. 
they don't generally raise the rent as high as they possibly could. Similarly, um, landlords who own these small, older buildings are, you know, these are Class C, even some Class D buildings are not charging the exorbitant rents that you see in the newer uh, luxury properties that are coming online. Um, many times, the uh, single-family home or the condominium that is rented is shared. How many of us didn't live as roommates when we got out of college or when we first started our career, right? So you have three or four people living in a rental um, uh, a condo or a townhouse that makes it much very affordable to the group as a, as a whole. Um, another thing about the, the, the characteristic of uh, small landlords is a very diverse group. You know, unlike the commercial re uh, real estate industry as a whole, which is pre overwhelmingly predominantly white male, you'll find that many of the uh, owners of uh, small rental properties are women and people of color, uh, brown and, and black people of color. Um, rental property, owning rental property has been a way to generate wealth um, f for, for the, the entire existence of this country. And which it brings me to my third point. The third point is that we're pursuing policies that are having an adverse impact on the provision of naturally recurring affordable housing because we're dissuading people from providing rental housing. We're, we're pursuing policies while well intended that are causing people to leave the rental housing industry. The eviction moratorium, the ban on rent increases, had a devastating impact on small landlords. I'm, I'm going to tell you, you saw people sell those houses. They sold those condos as soon as they got a chance to because the government froze their rents and told them what they couldn't do with their property. Even right now, uh, again, I'm a broker. Montgomery County is not looked at as one of the most landlord-friendly jurisdictions you know, in, in the region. It's not the most adverse landlord jurisdiction in the region. That would be the District of Columbia. And there are some policies that I heard discussed today uh, that, that rise to that level, which is just cause eviction. I'm going to tell you, I get calls every day. I got a call yesterday. Christian Legal Services referred an elderly woman to me to get help with her legal, with her landlord-tenant situation in the district. She has a tenant in her, that's been in her property for four years. But it's not paid rent that she can't get out. And those kind of policies, while well intended, have a devastating impact on the provision of affordable housing. Um, just in closing, real quickly, uh, the use of CoStar data. We've got to be very careful. CoStar doesn't capture everything. They do a great job on the Class A properties. They do a terrible job on the, on the Class C and D properties, right? So the small landlords really are not represented there. CoStar data also doesn't represent what's going on with our single-family homes, condominiums, and townhouses, right? Um, the second thing I want to, to uh, emphasize is that rents are going down uh, due to, you know, softening job market, uh, due to uh, um, um, high cost. Uh, the reality of the matter is that we are now seeing rents subside. The, 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 the growth that existed right after the moratorium is, is gone, and we are now seeing rents stabilize. So we don't, we don't see the, rise, the, the high rent increase that we saw after the pandemic. And again, small landlords aren't doing that anyway. Finally, uh, we need to look at ways that we can utilize our, our tax breaks and subsidies to facilitate uh, more people, more small landlords in particular, providing housing, right? What can we do differently with the Housing Choice Voucher Program? What kind of tax incentives can we give uh, to landlords uh, who rent out their home, who, who uh, forgive uh, delinquent rent and things of that nature? Um, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a very fragile system, and uh, small landlords play a very key role, and thank you for considering us as you deliberate. Appreciate that. Appreciate that perspective. A, a broad range, even though this is one category uh, with uh, uh, for, you know, for-profit providers and uh, landlords, a broad range of uh, perspectives here. I'll turn it to uh, Councilmember Juwando, I think, has a question or two. Thank you. I appreciate it. We could go all day with any of you, but I, we won't do that in respect for the next panel, too. A uh, couple things have been stated. Uh, they want to get their returns, right? You said that. They, the 80% of people who invest in housing here. The problem I have had is when we're asked to give taxpayer money, which we have to do, incentives, pilots, whatever it is, public land, the they and what their returns are, we don't know. There's no clarity on it. Um, and when you ask, it's 
you know, it's run around. I know what the costs are from your side, and you get kind of that picture. But you don't get a return. Is it 10? Is it 20? Is it, what, what is the return? And I think when you're asking people to put in public money, we're investors. Just the True. people are investors. So, and then the, and, and I also want you to respond to this part. There seems to be some contradictory terms here. If, if the, you need that investment, and you recoup that from the price of what rents are charged, building more housing should create downward pressure on rents. But the investors want to get the returns. There's a, there seems to be an inherent tension there, right? So could you speak to that? Yeah, I'll go to the second question first, if that's okay. Montgomery County, and, and I think all you know, I've been deeply invested in trying to help grow our life sciences market and do some other economic development. People are going to invest in Montgomery County if they believe the county is going to grow. And if they believe this is a market where job growth is going to happen, then that's going to drive housing demand. So if the fundamentals of the county are strong, we'll pass the first test of why people will consider investing in this market. So I've been very encouraged by the conversation, the first hearing of the Economic Development Committee, you know, conversations with the county executive about we have got to create job growth, which is going to create tax base. Tax base is going to create opportunities to invest in the important programs that all of us in this county love. So I think the first, the first test here is, is the county going to grow? Is it going to create jobs? Is there going to be economic growth that will drive reasons to invest in here? And we haven't done a great job of that. But I've heard just about unanimity among council members that you know this is an area that we've got to focus on because it's not only good for creating tax base, it's also good for, for everybody who lives in this county, wants to move in this county, and wants a better life in this county. So, And I would just ask that you be real concise so we can sure. yeah, okay. go ahead. Yeah. So so that that's that's why that's the first test. The second test is... I mean, we'll show you the math. I mean, it's, you know, I don't think you want to grind into what... Um, Not today. No, but, but yeah. Evan talked about the plan for downtown. It's now called HANTA. It was originally called the Middle Income Housing Tax Credit Program. I was one of the co-authors of it with several others. And what, what ultimately that did was inclusionary zoning is 8% in the district. It took full tax abatement to get the 33%. It got a 12 to 1 vote on the city council. The reason it got that vote is... We walked in and we showed the math, right. and we're happy to do that here. The numbers change, interest rates go up and down, sure. capital markets constrain, yeah. but there are target investment returns, and I'll, I'm happy to show how we make the math work, because that's otherwise, why would you go, wait, you have to do 15% NPDUs. What am I giving you to do Right, we want to make 30%. sure it's a, it's, a, it's a good deal, and I am not It's got to be a fair deal to everybody, right? Yeah, exactly. I'm not philosophically against that. As I said time and time again, we voted for a lot of things on the Fed Committee, probably mm -hmm. more in common than not. I just think the public needs to know that we're getting the best deal for them, and there's not always a lot of clarity on that. Oh, fair enough. Uh, I'll add one thing just as a core, um, an example of when we did this jointly with the council was back in the Whiteland Sector Plan many years ago, about 10 years ago now. Uh, the same question came up um, when we were talking about how much density, how much how much additional density should be given in order to incentivize redevelopment of the shopping centers there. And so we had four different developers who had built four projects. I'm sorry, we had four existing assets run the economics of tearing down their existing assets and building new, and then blended those four pro formas so we could show what a um, an average building would look like so that no one was giving away their individual secret information about their development, but can collectively you guys had the data. And that's how we came up with, or the Planning Commission came up with, the FARs that they recommended for the sector plan. So something like that in collaboration with many of the people in the room probably helped you get there. Appreciate it. And then the, the, the second and last question at this time, and we'll follow up, we'll be talking for years, hopefully, is, you know, if you look at over the last 30 years, the voluntary rent guidelines have averaged like 3.6%, well below everything that is presented and this has always been my question. If that's the case, if you're not raising rents higher than that, which the vast majority of our landlords are not, I'm a two-time Southern Management alum, um, Claridge House, and uh, you know, so you can come on back here. I, I, I'm okay. yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> and, and so, what is the objection to the stability that nearly 40% of our residents want to know? Just like someone who, like me, who owns a 30-year mortgage, I know every year what I'm going to pay. Uh, so why, if they're gonna, if they're averaging that, why? What's an objection to some sort of reasonable? And I'm so happy to hear that my last four years of work has moved Southern Management from nothing at all, including anti-rent gouging, to now being for something. 
That's a great discussion. Now we're talking just about the number. But so just help me understand and the folks here and everyone that's watching why something that is in line with what you've been doing anyway would not be okay. That's a great question and a fair question. And we get it all the time because our rents are always below even the CPI, right? The real problem is kind of what I had tried to address in the PowerPoint and probably didn't do the best job with it, but it is our lenders. Like right now, 67 of my assets are in one loan. Our lender, that loan is interest only. The interest rates go up so much and our lender has said we can't do interest only next time around if there's rent control because it doesn't just impact how we look at LTV when we're underwriting the loan, which is our loan to value. We look at our exit on an interest only loan. We have to look at our exit strategy and exactly the, the predictability that you crave creates problems, especially with an older housing stock like Southern has because it costs more each year to operate older housing product instead of tearing it down and building new. And as those costs grow and rent cannot grow with it or cannot capture a full you know, repair that needs to be done that doesn't qualify as a capital improvement, then our lending underwriting looks at it and says, we can't give you the same deal you once had. So there are external pressures we're feeling. Additionally, we have to look at the very four real consequences I addressed, you know, the gentrification, the housing disinvestment, it's very real, and um, the housing deterioration and the tax revenue. We believe 100%, and I appreciate your recognition of our movement, Councilmember Joanna, we agree something needs to be done. And what we've learned is that how rent stabilization and rent control is a distinction without a difference to our investors and our financiers. Anti-rent gouging is something they can live with without impacting our ability to finance and our ability to continue maintaining our asset. Yeah. So there is a real difference there in how you approach the language of a bill that will still provide some level of stability and predictability for your renters. Because no, we can't give you a rent clock that says next year it will be X, but you know it won't be Y. Yeah. And you know it won't be Z, and you know it won't be 40% or 20%, because that can be egregious. And what we have found is that those bad actors make our whole industry look bad, it makes it harder. We wanna work with the council, with the county, to provide some measure of reasonable stability, but it can't be to the detriment of how we run our product. I appreciate that. I will, I will just point out my, my the bill I introduced was an anti-rent gouging bill, <laughs> so we just have to find the right numbers, but I appreciate the movement and uh, yield to you. my colleagues. Thank you. I'll uh, turn it to Council Member Fani Gonzalez. Very quickly, I look forward to having a conversation with you, Ms. Uh, Gabriel Duvall, um, about everything that you just mentioned, so I'll follow up. Uh, on a one on one at some point. Uh, I did, uh, you just reminded me, uh, the project that you highlighted, uh, Summer Hills? Yeah. yeah, that was in Leetonsville. And that kind of broke my heart when you mentioned that you're not redeveloping there because that's a, a master plan that I worked on. And, uh, and I hope one day you could reconsider invest over there because that property I know it very well. After being, I come from the Park and Planning Commission. And I will say to you that that zoning amendment in 2017, the work that was done, we would love nothing more than to look at opportunities at Claridge House, at Summit Hills, yes. all through the Littonsville sector. Working together with you on a long-term solution like anti-rent gouging that takes away the threat of instability to our market would allow us to reinvest in the county in a different way. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time. That's it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Appreciate all of the, the conversation here. I think there is another subsequent conversation on this question of yeah. MPDUs, and uh, I would love to you know do a deeper dive uh, into that. I think it's another example of something that we need to have a follow up conversation about. But uh, you know this uh, idea, and, and uh, Mr. Furstenberg, you in your discussion, you know, essentially talked about this: the percentage of subsidy that is required that's largely paid by the other rents in the building. And the question is, you know, that's been proposed is, well, why can't we just increase it? We increased it from 12 and a half to 15% and virtually every new uh, master plan, uh, why, why can't we do it? I, I'm not sure today is the best day for us to do that deeper dive because uh, in the interest of time, but I just wanted to put the marker down. That's another conversation that we can add uh, to this for a future discussion and really appreciate the foundation that's been set here from uh, all of our providers. So thank you for that. We're gonna call up our Final panel here on rent burden impacts and rent relief programs. Uh, we have service provider perspectives and some program updates from uh, the executive branch. Uh, Tram Huang, the senior associate from 
policy link. Uh, this was at the request of CASA, who was invited to participate and asked uh, Tram Huang uh, to provide uh, your expertise uh, to us on this subject matter. Uh, Matt Losak, Executive Director of Montgomery County Renters Alliance, uh, works in the field with a lot of our renters in the county. Uh, we have Amanda Harris, the uh, Chief in Services to End and Prevent Homelessness, Seth, uh, to many of us uh, here at the County Council in the Department of uh, Health and Human Services, uh, and Mary Gentry, uh, Chief of Division of Housing, uh, along with Summer Cross, uh, Manager for Affordable Housing in the Department uh, of Housing and Community Affairs. So with that, uh, let's start with you, Ms. Wang. Hi, everyone. My name is Trump Wong. Um, I'm a senior associate at PolicyLink, and it's a pleasure to be here today. So thank you for the opportunity. I'll try to keep it short. Um, so I, uh, as I said, I'm a member of uh, a staff member at PolicyLink. We're a national research and policy institute whose work focuses on advancing racial and economic justice, um, specifically by advancing policies across many sectors that support the 100 million Americans who live at or below poverty. Let me go next. Um, oh, sorry, one more. I'm trying to fly through this. Um, one more, please. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think it skipped too. Oh yeah. Okay. And I apologize, I mispronounced your name, so apologies. Oh, it's okay. We have not spoken before, so it's, <laughs> it's all good. Um, sorry. So I want to start off with, you know, given the, the work that I do is, is national, um, I work at the federal government level as well as supporting state and local um, governments in, in advancing housing solutions. And so I just want to zoom out and name um, a, a report that recently came out by Moody's Analytics that was reported um, reported by the New York Times that says, you know, we have reached a dangerous tipping point in the United States, which is that the typical American renter, meaning someone who is earning median income and also um, paying average rent, is rent burdened. And that's a historic milestone, right, in, in not a good way. Um, and so just to, to frame for us that this is not a, a local or specific issue, right? It's happening across the country. And in addition to state and local governments taking action, the federal government is also. So as you all know, the, there's the Biden supply plan that focuses on increasing the supply of housing. And the White House also um, announced that the Federal Housing Finance Agency will be examining proposed actions that um, limit predatory and egregious rent increases for future investments by the FHFA. So this is something that's being considered um, at the federal level. And we'll go to the next slide. Um, so I'll go through this very quickly because you've all seen these numbers and seen more local numbers, but the National Low Income Housing Coalition recently reported in their 2022 report that in order to afford a typical two-bedroom rental, the average minimum wage worker would have to work 93 hours a week, or that's the equivalent of 2.3 full-time jobs, so clearly untenable. Next slide. Um, and then I will definitely pass this because I think the planning staff provided much more localized and specific data on this. But um, rent burden and cost burden is an issue across race and class. But more importantly, it is most deeply impacting um, households of color, immigrant and refugee households, um, households for whom English is not their first language. And so the, the racial equity impacts of cost burden are, um, are massive. And so we see these numbers all the time. Over time, we've seen these numbers worsen. And across policy links work with various research institutions who are looking at empirical evidence, right? So that's what is actually happening on the ground, not economic theory. Um, we know that there are policies that work. And so we'll go to the next slide. Um, Oh, sorry, one more. <laughs> My bad. So we know that there is an entire spectrum of policy solutions that are necessary in order to address our housing crisis because it is a crisis that was born of 10,000 paper cuts, right? And so in order to repair it, we need just as many housing solutions. So we're looking at the entire spectrum. We're talking about home ownership programs for those who choose the pathway of home ownership, increased down payment assistance, um, making sure that racial bias is not a part of the um, the evaluation uh, evaluation process for homes, right? We also need tenant protections to keep, keep people in community. Just cause, which I want to name because it was mentioned earlier, non-payment of rent is one of the most common reasons for a just cause eviction. So 
putting that on the record. Just cause is necessary. Right to counsel is necessary in order to give people who are um, who have an eviction filed against them the opportunity to be represented in court. We know that makes a big difference. We need advance notice so that tenants have um, a, an actual humane amount of time to adapt to the new reality that they live in, right? Which is my rent might be going up by X percent. I need at least 30, 60 days to figure out what my next step is. Um, and then, of course, rent stabilization is in there. Um, we also need to increase the supply of housing. That is something that I really appreciate has been named, right? And in in addition to increasing supply of housing, we also need to name that um, not all supply is equal because there are sub-markets in which there is greater need. And so vacancy across the board is a great measure, but vacancy um, within those sub-markets for incomes, for class of building is also really important so that we can make sure we're producing where housing is most needed. And then, of course, we need increased federal, state, and local investments like you've all spoken about um, to make building deeply affordable housing um, easier. And then one thing that I did not put in the slide but I've heard discussed that I think is very important is preservation, right? We know we have a, a leaking bucket of naturally occurring affordable housing. So how do we make sure there are policies in place, whether that's tenant opportunity to purchase or right of first refusal, that help um, tenants and also nonprofit developers and cities and counties um, take ownership of those buildings so that they can maintain longer term affordability. And so all that to say, rent stabilization is, is not a silver bullet. There's no solution that is a silver bullet, but it's a part of the solution and we cannot solve the housing crisis without it. So next I want to talk about um, why rent stabilization. I think we've heard a few reasons for why not, and so I just want to uplift um, some of the reasons why it does work and the benefits that it provides. Um, so to start off, the data shows, we know this nationally and also locally, that low-income renters and renters of color are most impacted by egregious rent increases. So rent stabilization is both a solution that advances housing stability and racial justice in our housing system. Secondly, we know that our nation has a massive racial homeownership gap. And what better way to help renters, or as I like to call us, um, potential homeowners, right, especially renters of color, save for down payments, than to provide some kind of predictability for their monthly housing payments. Um, knowing that I can put $200 aside a month for my down payment is, is critical to getting there. Um, third, I want to touch on homelessness, which I know hasn't been discussed a ton today, um, but the U.S. Government Accountability Office found that each $100 increase in median rent can actually be correlated to a 9% increase in the estimated homelessness rate, and so clearly there's, there's a relationship there. Um, fourth, we know that the growth of private equity and corporate landlords in our housing market across the country has been growing rapidly, especially after the foreclosure crisis. And tenant protections, like rent stabilization, um, are a mechanism to disrupt the predatory practices on which the foundations of their profit-driven models are built. And um, I'll touch on this really lightly, but rent stabilization can create a lot of transparency in local housing markets. A lot of times there aren't local rental registries to keep track of who owns what, where rents are going up, and so um, rent stabilization policies often come with this increased ability to track what's happening in our local housing systems. And then lastly, um, I think this is probably the most important thing, is that rent stabilization provides immediate and cost-effective protections that complement all the other housing strategies that were discussed today and that are necessary. When we think about housing supply, we know that the amount of time it takes to get financing, put in the application, um, put the deal together, and then get to a shovel on the ground, let alone ready for move-in, it can take years and years, and it can cost upwards of half a million dollars per unit. And so um, as we are waiting for that process to happen as we are waiting for our supply gap to get filled um, with new construction. We also need to make sure that the people who we want to have benefit from that new construction can actually stay in our communities, and that is the, the protection that rent stabilization provides. Um, it, I think about it as uh, a lot of parallels to our labor market, right? Even if everyone had a job, we need minimum wage, we need earned sick and leave time, we need family leave protections. And the same goes to housing. Even if we had enough units for everyone in our country, um, proximity doesn't mean access, right? Proximity, just the fact that a unit exists does not mean um, that someone can live there. We have tenant screening policies that keep people out of homes. We have um, 
a lack of tenant protections that that doesn't ensure housing stability or access to housing. And so we need to make sure that um, it's, it's not so much what we build, but also who we build for and if we're building um, in ways that target intentionally the folks who need housing the most. And then lastly, I will go to this final slide. Um, I want to touch on where rent stabilization is working. So a few examples were named earlier of um, policies that I think could have been improved upon, right? I think that's the great thing about rent stabilization is that it's unique to every jurisdiction. And so when you all are approaching it, you can definitely learn some lessons from cities who have who might have gotten it wrong, right? There are better ways to build policy, and we're constantly building on that. Um, what's not common knowledge is that rent stabilization has had a long history in the United States. We've experienced it for over 100 years. Um, the federal government enacted rent stabilization policies after World War I, and currently over 180 jurisdictions in the U.S., both state, county, city, have rent stabilization laws in place. So while we can point at a few, you know, bad eggs, uh, I don't think that points to the overall effectiveness of rent stabilization policies as a whole. Um, in, in we'll, oh yeah, sorry. In uh, 2019, both Oregon and California has passed statewide rent regulation, and then within the past few years, there have been multiple cities and counties that have either passed or strengthened their rent stabilization laws. And I think part of the strengthening is, is due to the fact that some of them are CPI-based, and of course, in these last few years, we have seen historic um, inflation rates that are, are really quite unprecedented. And so adjustments have been made to make sure that rent stabilization can um, Right, it's, it's an evolving policy and it can be adapted to serve those who need it most the best. And the last slide that I have is just an example of some of the most recent rent stabilization policies that have been passed um, around the country. So Oakland, for example, has a rate that is um, annual cap of 60% of CPI or 3%, whichever is lower. St. Paul, as folks have mentioned, is 3%. Um, the ordinance has been amended in multiple ways, but City Council has actually chosen to keep the cap the same at 3%. And, and then, of course, you see other policies around the country with um, examples of annual caps. And I won't go into any more detail on that because I know time is short for other speakers. So thank you again for the opportunity to share. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, as noted, the presentations, including this one, will be posted uh, on the website. Uh, we appreciate that. With that, uh, Matt Losak with the Renters Alliance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Council members. Uh, first of all, I want to compliment my colleague here at PolicyLink. Uh, what she said is what I think. So uh, I'll take credit for everything that she said because uh, we support it and we appreciate her detail. Uh, we've known PolicyLink for as long as we've been around and they've been a, an incredible resource uh, for the information that we have. Uh, the Renters Alliance is the first and only regional nonprofit dedicated exclusively to renter outreach, education, organizing, and advocacy. We are the leading co-founders of Renters United Maryland. Uh, and as you know, we've been advocates for what uh, Ms. Wong has been talking about and others in our partnership and coalition uh, in terms of rent stabilization, just cause eviction law, increased enforcement and effective enforcement at DHCA of code uh, and of uh, Office of Landlord and Tenant Affairs. And for that matter, with the uh, more effective distribution of rent relief funds provided by state and federal government. Um, I have to say, and I'll be brief because much was already said by Ms. Wong that we support, but we are seeing up close the forced migration of working and low-income families in our region. Uh, we are distributing literature to door three, between three and 6,000 doors per month uh, with the Renters Alliance field operation. Um, we are also working with the county. We established a writ, writ of, of restitution outreach program with the county where we divide up among the partners who work with the county to go to those people who are facing imminent eviction and provide them with information about resources. The COVID rent relief program was closed on January 13th, and yet we're still seeing the writ of restitution list grow. Uh, in January of last year, uh, the, uh, uh, let me pull it up real quick, sorry. The uh, evictions conducted were 37. Uh, this last month, evictions were triple that. Uh, and of course, the writ of restitution list and the rest is even uh, three times the actual evictions that are carried out. So this is the tip of the iceberg. There was data discussed before, Mr. Uh, Friedson, and I think we all appreciate in terms of getting a real reality check. 
One of the ways in which we don't see data is the destabilization numbers that do not go to the courts. So we are seeing thousands of people who are moving out of their homes, and we don't know why. We, we've heard why. We've heard that they can't afford their apartments anymore. They've heard that the code has not uh, enforced enough so that they're seeing vermin or mold or some other condition in their apartment communities that hasn't been resolved or a combination thereof, and they are losing hope. They are threatened by their landlords. They receive uh, threatening letters, they receive lawyer letters, and they want to get out before they end up having to go to court and ultimately may be evicted. And they don't know where to turn to because even with our operation, we're still only scratching the surface of nearly 30, nearly 40 percent of the county who rents their homes. That's hundreds of thousands of people. If we had five or six thousand apartments uh, a month and we sometimes have to go back to the same troubled properties again and again, we're still only scratching the surface. Um, I would like to address briefly the idea and challenge this for a future discussion, um, the idea that we can build our way out of this problem. We do not in any way oppose the building of new uh, apartment communities in Montgomery County. Bravo, go ahead, every which way, all different types, different choices, and so on. But we believe it's a mirage to suggest that we can build our way sufficiently to flood the market and bring prices down. We have to think about the existing tenants who live here now and their ability to hold on to their housing, to have predictable rents, to have uh, reasonable rents, and to event, prevent uh, rent gouging. And on the issue of rent gouging, um, it's true that we are seeing, according to DHCA numbers, 75% of all of the complaints that have come in since we started asking renters to file their complaints with the Office of Landlord and Tenant Affairs, 75%, according to DHCA, are in the double digits. We think that's the tip of the iceberg because not everybody is reporting the kind of rents that they're seeing. But we also don't have a drilled down apartment by apartment. What is going on with this data? Why are you moving? What kind of rent increases are you facing? So we urge the council to work with the ATA to see that the next data collection operation be more thorough and more drilled down. And a rent gouge does not have to be in the double digits. As you all know, uh, many of our uh, renters are senior citizens and others living on fixed incomes. Their incomes are not going up by 3, 5, and 8 percent. So uh, sometimes an increase of 5 percent, 6 percent, 7 percent, or 8 percent is a gouge for them. We are seeing an increasing number of them, particularly senior citizens, particularly women, who are being forced more and more after not just 50 percent of their income going to housing, but 70, 80, or 90 percent of their income going to housing, where they are choosing between food and medicine and rent. So it is a crisis. Uh, because it doesn't affect anybody, everybody doesn't mean that it's not affecting tens of thousands of our residents. One has to ask, if we're looking at a rent stabilization program, the landlords are good at telling you what it will cost them, but we also have to ask ourselves, what is it costing us if we do not? We are seeing tenants who are going to move. We're seeing tenants who are having increased health risks because of the anxiety of not knowing where they're going to live. We're seeing children moving from school to school, affecting their academic achievement. And I know, Mr. Friedson, you're very good at the numbers, and you know that we spend billions of dollars on our education system. So we want to see a good return there. And if students do not achieve academically, we are going to lose out in the long run. And if anybody saw our, our town hall meeting last night at the Silver Spring Civic Center, the issue of rising crime uh, was top of the list. And so when people feel unstable and there's increased anxiety, increased mental health issues, we're also seeing increased crime issues as a result of, in part, because of housing instability. So I can go on, I won't, but uh, I want to associate myself with the remarks of PolicyLink uh, and tell you that there is a problem that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Appreciate those perspectives. Uh, thank you for that. And it was noted that we haven't heard uh, any perspectives and, and comments related to homelessness in the county. We have uh, the Chief of Services to End and Prevent Homelessness, Ms. Savannah Harris, and now I'll turn to you. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, happy to be here this afternoon. And there have definitely been a lot of salient points raised by the other panelists, so I don't need to echo those. I do just want to highlight, and I appreciate uh, raising the issue of homelessness because homelessness is a housing problem. We have homelessness because people can't afford housing and their incomes are too low. So there is a direct connection. Uh, it is not uh, a surprise or by accident that cities that have the least affordability, New York, San Francisco, Seattle, 
uh, LA have the highest numbers of homelessness, right, with 50,000 people sleeping unsheltered. So uh, this is certainly a, um, an issue that needs to be raised. I will not spend as much time talking about homelessness because there is another session coming up next month and I could speak for probably four hours about homelessness. Uh, so I've been asked today to just give you uh, an update on our programs that do address uh, rent relief and sort of what we're seeing on the ground. So you're probably most familiar with the COVID rent relief program that has been operating actually since May of 2020. Uh, and we have uh, to date served over 12,000 households through that program and distributed over $90 million. Uh, I think it's important to note that the vast majority of those funds have gone directly to landlords. Uh, so this is not just a tenant program, but it is also in support of, of landlords. Uh, and as Mr. Losek said, the portal did close. So we are no longer accepting applications for that program, but we are still processing. Uh, so. Um, we will, the people can still receive those funds and we're just not accepting new applications. Uh, we do, however, have our existing eviction prevention program, the Housing Stabilization Services, uh, where we can provide assistance to stave off an eviction. Uh, we also, through that program, offer utility assistance, uh, relocation. Um, uh, unfortunately, because the funds are so limited, and even with the hundred plus million dollars that we received from uh, the federal government, we still did not have anywhere near enough to help everyone that was behind on rent. Uh, and to help all the households, I believe there's over 30,000 households that are paying more than 30% of their income here in Montgomery County. So we serve 12,000, uh, that's about half. Uh, so our programs are, are targeted to those that are most in need. So uh, low income, very low income and extremely low income, uh, typically below 30% AMI, uh, but we can go up to 50% AMI. Uh, and we are seeing in those programs that households are coming in and even if we pay off their balance, so they haven't been able to pay month for six months. We pay off $20,000 to the landlord. Uh, and then in, uh, in a month or two, uh, there is a tenant holding over. They're being asked to leave because they're increasing the rent and they can no longer afford it. Uh, so that is something that we are uh, definitely struggling with. At what point do we say, maybe it makes more sense for us to use these resources to put you in a, in a new place? Um, or do we pay this off and, and uh, hope that we can get you connected to someplace more affordable? There are fewer and fewer places that are that are more affordable. So uh, it is it is definitely a, a challenge that we're seeing. Uh, I will also say in our other programs that those that's a a, a time limited program, crisis intervention. We do have other rent relief programs that are uh, time limited. Um, we have a uh, uh, our, our rapid rehousing. We also have a 12 month subsidy program uh, and those have been really successful initially getting people into housing quickly, but we are still struggling to figure out, okay, well, what's next? Because most of the time, uh, even throughout that program, if we're able to help people increase their income, it's still not enough to sustain. So there does need to be some additional supports on the, on the back end. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to point out is that even in our programs where it is a permanent subsidy, so uh, HHS is paying the vast majority of the rent, uh, sometimes as much as 90% uh, of the rent, uh, we are still seeing people being um, dislocated. So we're seeing uh, households that have been in permanent supportive housing for a number of years, uh, but they are now, uh, their landlord is choosing to not renew their lease. Uh, and so that is putting a strain on the system because now we're competing to house people that rehouse people that were in our existing programs, but also try and house uh, the folks that have just entered homelessness. Uh, and that I suspect that that is due to wanting to increase the rent above the amount that our subsidy will pay. Uh, so, so there's lots of lots of uh, external pressure there, uh, and I I would be remiss if I didn't say this is also an equity issue. 
Uh, we know that homelessness has a disproportionate impact on people of color, in particular black or African Americans. Uh, in Montgomery County, 60% of people that are experiencing homelessness identify as black or African American compared to what, 18, 19% of the general population. Uh, and I believe that this has a lot to do with uh, systemic raci racism, but in particular, decades and decades and decades of housing discrimination. Um, inability for uh, black households to purchase homes, uh, to create that wealth, to pass up wealth from generation to generation. So they don't, uh, in many households we're seeing everyone in their network doesn't have a lot. So there, is, there, is a, there isn't that ability to kind of take care of each other. Uh, so we have a lot of um, work to do to try and rectify that. Uh, and then the final thing I w will say is that uh, we do need landlords. They are our partners, uh, and they're very valuable to us, uh, in particular private landlords. Uh, we have, um, uh, have pretty good relationships with private landlords that are more willing to rent to folks that maybe have um, less than perfect rental history, I will say. Uh, and so we want to try and do what we can uh, to keep our landlords invested in our work. So we do, in fact, have a landlord risk mitigation fund, uh, and that is basically an insurance fund for landlords that choose to uh, house individuals in our housing programs. And that can cover repairs, it can cover back rent. Um, so we, we do, we are really invested in taking care of all our partners. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Now we'll turn to the Department of Housing and Community Affairs. Thank you, council members. Um, I appreciate you having this discussion today on affordable housing. It's a critical issue in Montgomery County. My name is Mary Gentry. I am the uh, Chief of Housing for the Department of Housing and Community Affairs. And I'm here with my colleague, Summer uh, Cross, who is the manager in charge of the um, moderately priced dwelling units program. Within DHCA, we have two major programs that are focused on developing and preserving affordable housing. Uh, the moderately priced dwelling program, um, MPDUs, and the multifamily housing program. Our multifamily housing team leverages a range of financing tools, including state, federal, and local funds, pilots, rent stabilization monies to support the development and the preservation of affordable housing. Uh, in this, uh, in fiscal year 22, we were able to preserve and develop 684 units of affordable housing. Uh, we closed nine loans totaling, totaling $33.3 million. Um, and just so you know, and I think most of you are aware of this, we engage with both for profit and nonprofit developers to ensure a certain level of affordability in all housing developments in Montgomery County. Our MPDU program is the first inclusionary zoning program in the United States. It is also a model program that is used uh, throughout this country and elsewhere uh, for the development of similar programs. Our program was started in 1974 and it will be 50 years old in 2024. The um, MPDUs are government regulated units, and well I'll say government related units that must be affordable to households earning up to 70 percent AMI. For high-rise rentals and for sale units built under the program. For all new developments consisting of 20 or more housing units, 12.5 to 15 percent must be affordable. And during uh, fiscal year 2022, 184 MPDUs were built. Of those, 62 were for sale and 122 were rental units. Uh, MPD units are under a 99-year covenant and for sale units are under a 30-year restriction. Uh, in both cases, we're trying to maintain the affordability of these units over the long term. To get into the MPDU program, you're required to apply for it. Uh, we have training that is available that uh, each person who wants to apply has to go through and become certified to participate in the program. All families need a safe, stable, healthy place to live. 
the developments that HCD, mm, HC, mm, I'm sorry, DHCA is involved in occurs throughout Montgomery County, from Damascus to D Germantown to Olney to Bethesda, Silver Spring, and elsewhere in between. We are committed to trying to make affordable housing available to families throughout our county. As you know, and this is stated earlier, M Montgomery County is the most populous county uh, in the state of Maryland. And it is also highly diverse demographically. We also have some of the best schools and great employment opportunities, all of which makes Montgomery County a very desirable place to call home. When it comes to issues that we're seeing regarding affordable housing, there are a number of them. And I just wanna mention a couple that just come to mind. Overcrowding. Overcrowding is often done by low-income individuals as a way of managing their rents. By having another person come and stay in your two-bedroom apartment gives you another outlet and allows you to reduce the overall rent that the other two people may be paying. So that's their way of handling that. And I do want to mention homelessness. And although homelessness is often not really, and I'm so glad that you're here to talk about it directly, it is a major issue. Many of the people in Montgomery County, I mean, you just look around, you will see them at the bus stops, uh, rolling down the, you know, with a, a grocery cart with all their belongings. So Mont uh, Montgomery County has a very real problem with homelessness. Uh, some of the homeless people that we're seeing are folks who are veterans. We're also seeing young people, some are, of whom are aging out of foster care. That's a major issue. We need to have better programs in place to ensure that those young people are placed in some type of transitional housing so that they do not have to become homeless. Um, so those are some of the issues I, I just want to make sure we, we talk about. Uh, another one is financial hardship. Low-income people, people at the bottom of the economic rungs, just one, one accident, one health care issue, it doesn't take a lot. The car broke down, and all of a sudden, you're behind in your rent. So we have issues like that, and we do not have easily available resources to support people who are in those kinds of situations. Job loss, medical care, it doesn't matter. I mean, they're in precarious situations. We need to be aware of it, and we need to understand or figure out if there's some other things we might be able to do. There is also a supply-demand imbalance. We do not have sufficient housing. That, that's been said earlier. We do not have sufficient housing to house the number of people who want to be in our, our county. I also want to mention the rural areas. We rarely talk about the rural areas of this county, but they also need quality housing. And we also need to ensure that we're doing something to um, provide sustainable housing for them. We need larger units and, you know, four or five bedroom units for low income people, uh, many of whom, depending upon where they're from, um, their family culture would encourage them to stay you know, the younger people stay with the grandparents and the parents, and that's not unusual. And we need to be able to accommodate that. And we generally are not building larger units with three and four, five bedrooms. So that's a real need. So the other thing that, um, and this has been talked about, but I want to mention it in a different way. Home ownership is occurring less and less and now, later. I don't mean to cut you off, but we're going we're gonna to have a separate conversation. We're going to talk about home ownership. We're a little bit limited. Okay, then I'll, I'll uh, leave it to later. Okay, then let me say on the MPDU program in 2022, we uh, were able to create, and these are all new, um, a total of 724 units, MPDUs. Of those, um, 62 were for ownership, home ownership, and 122 were for rent. So, um, Okay, I know we're we're late on time, so I won't continue because there's just a lot about appreciate this. it. Well, we're going to invite you Thank back you. when we talk about home ownership because we do want to get an update on the okay. three million dollar appropriation for first time homeowners and how that program is working. We know it's oversubscribed; it's always been oversubscribed. I'm glad we added a million dollars. The previous iteration of uh, of this committee, I did want to ask, um, and and we're short on time here, so I'll be limited. But uh, it was noted earlier the rent relief program has been 
uh, wound down. Uh, on January 13th, if you didn't have your application before then, you are not going to be able to be eligible uh, for uh, funding. Just wanted to get an update. According to my information, $94.3 million had been approved up to January 16th. I know the department is still reviewing. How much money is available based on the additional applications that were submitted before January 13th? How much is you know, how much money is available for those who are deemed to be eligible at this point? Uh, let me see if I can answer that. Um, I I might have to get back to you on the. You exact can get back to us if you need. Uh, but Did you I, have an order of magnitude. Yeah, I believe we have around 13, 14 million remaining. Uh, and we expect that that will be fully expended with the applicants that we have right now. And the reason why it was cut off on January 13th is because you Correct. believe that you have enough applications that will be eligible in order to exhaust all the funds? Correct. That is correct. Okay. Uh, what is the plan for after that? Mm -hmm. I mean, is, is there an additional funding request that's coming in the budget? Do we have a timeline for what we expect? Do we have an order of magnitude? It, it, I mean, understandably, it has sent some shockwaves to the community that the primary mechanism that we were providing rental relief support has been suspended. You no longer can even apply. I understand that hope is a dangerous thing. It can take a long time to actually receive those funds uh, that are needed. Uh, but we're not aware of a plan, you know, at the council, which is, you know, disconcerting, and certainly the public isn't aware of a plan. Those who are uh, rent burdened uh, are, aren't aware of a plan. Do we, do we have a plan or a timeline for when we might be aware of a plan or an approach for how we're going to address those who are in need of funds, who have been relying on funds, who now have been told they're no longer eligible to apply for those funds? Sure. So. As I mentioned uh, earlier, we do have our housing stabilization services. So we had eviction prevention pre-pandemic. Uh, and so that is still available to households. Now, in order to, res to be prioritized for housing, well, to be eligible for housing stabilization services, you do in fact need to have a judgment from the court. Uh, so uh, in our rent re COVID rent relief programs, uh, you just needed to be behind right. on and rent. And Mr. Losak was talking earlier about how some people are coming short of getting to yeah. that point in which they would not be eligible for what were our pre-COVID programs. If you don't go through the court proceeding, you then can't be eligible for that pot of money. That is right. correct, because we are going from operating with the federal funds, uh, our annual budget was around $40 million for eviction prevention. Our regular budget is $4 million. Right. So we do not have enough funds uh, to operate, no, to operate the, the same program. Um, but I just, I think this is an important point. And we're heading yeah. into the budget, which we expect to get on March 15th. And last year's budget, there was $40 million of cash that we used for a naturally uh, occurring affordable housing fund, which is great and which we all support it. There, you know, is an opportunity to provide significant resources, to look at what the state is going to do, and I'm hoping, and we're all advocating for additional state support with the new administration, which has been an ongoing advocacy effort that many of us have been part of that we'll continue to push for. There's the Delegate Stewart bill, the one for one, uh, you know, for, 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 for uh, production and, and preservation and other, uh, you know, uh, projects. There's a lot of different layers uh, to this, but I think it's important for us to understand all the layers of current funding that are available, mm -hmm. all of the resources that have been exhausted over the last few years on an annualized basis. I have lots of numbers in front of me that I won't share here. And then a reasonable plan, what we expect or what we hope for the state can step in with and what we need to come up with the gap. And then I think we need to have a realistic conversation of how much are we willing to put forward for this program in the operating budget. Right. Maybe it can't be forty million, but maybe it really shouldn't be four million. May, you know, and uh, you know, I don't know what that number is, but as we talk about finding the appropriate numbers here as part of this conversation, we have to have the conversation, and and you've got to ask for it. 
uh, from us, and 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 we have to have, you know, a, a more proactive conversation. You know, I think we should have had this conversation nine months ago, uh, you know, a year ago, because we knew this moment was coming. We didn't do that, unfortunately, but we need to do it now. Yeah. I agree. So what I will say is uh, there has been some ARPA funds that have been allocated for eviction prevention. So we do have an additional, I believe it's $3.4 million. Um, it will take us some time to get through the remaining funds of the ERAP, the Emergency uh, Rental Assistance Program from Treasury. Uh, but yes, we, we do need to have a discussion about not just how much do we need because i think the amount we need we're never going to get there isn't there isn't enough funds uh to 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 help everyone that is behind in rent so i think uh another question that we need to ask is who are we going to prioritize how are we going to make those decisions and what other non-financial things can we do to support tenants uh, can we provide more um, case management, can more education around tenant rights, uh, supporting advocacy. legal services, which we provide yeah, you know, extra funding correct. for. Yeah, I, I have, agree. But so if, if we, we need to know more sure. of that, we're going to need to know it in advance. There's a budget that's coming up. What I don't want to do is get into the situation where we miss the opportunity to actually include this funding in the budget. And then we're having this conversation that we knew we, were, we needed that we knew we should have had and we're sitting there figuring out well where do we find the money for it and and we got to we got to do it in just, advance there's a reason why we have a budget process Mr. Maybe just that. quickly yeah. just to point out some clarifications too the covid rent relief program only covered those who were eligible who had been impacted by COVID. We've seen many people who were not eligible who were desperate for rent relief. The COVID rent relief program covered twelve to $18,000 in back rent. The services standard to prevent homelessness is far less in number, is that correct? That is correct, but those are, there are, there are limits, uh, caps on the funding for the housing stabilization services, but those are just policies. So we can change those. And I, I just, I, I have to say, you know, I work for the county executive. Uh, I support the county executive's budget that will come out in mid-March. Uh, but these are certainly conversations that we are having. Uh, yeah, I just think we should have them more collaboratively than have occurred. We weren't aware that the announcement was coming until it came. Mm -hmm. And we found out about it when everybody else found out about it. Sent shockwaves through the community based on the entire conversation that we've had today and so i am hopeful i think there is agreement here and let's you know not snatch conflict from the jaws of consensus that we need more funding what exactly that number is going to be and who we prioritize and how we deploy it those are conversations that we are going to need to work through but we need to be doing it now because i don't want to get to a situation where the budget comes forward and there isn't agreement, and then we have to have much tougher and I think unnecessarily more difficult conversations uh, down the line. So I'm, I'm pleading and urging uh, as representatives of the uh, executive branch that we can work together on this. We're uh, here to, to, to work together uh, on it as we move forward. And I think we have several weeks before the budget is dropped for us to work through this and figure out what this looks like. I think in the meantime, it would be helpful for us to understand what are all the buckets of money that remain? What are they earmarked for, You know, including who they support? Because they're not necessarily the same exact pop. We all know there are people in need, but those needs are different and what they support are different, as Mr. Losak just noted. And, and I think you know, breaking it down in a concise way for us to you know, understand in a, in a timely manner would be helpful and then having this discussion that I think we need to have so that we're ready as part of the budget to make this support part of this budget because we realize that the federal money that we've been relying on that exponentially increased the amount of support that we could provide which we recognize still didn't meet the full need has dried up and is no more and we got to figure out what we do now and I think we got to figure that out. You mentioned that uh, you were looking to the new administration in the Annapolis 
Um, I'm proud to say the chair of our board, William Roberts, is a co-chair uh, of the Housing Transition Committee for the Moore Miller administration. Uh, and I think we may have a partner there, but I, like you, I'm not a big supporter of hope. I'm a big uh, supporter of reality. Uh, and so we look to you and to the county executive to help us advocate to free up some of the available money in the state to support HHS and the services that are being delivered. We are seeing desperate people out there. Absolutely. Final question related to the data. We heard in the beginning of this presentation, which feels like days ago, was uh, about three and a half hours ago uh, almost, and I appreciate everybody's patience uh, and, and, and uh, respectfulness uh, throughout this process. Uh, but the data that was being discussed from the, uh, that the OLO report is going to be based on is largely a year old. In, in April, it's, it's going to be a year old. And I was just wondering if we have any plans for more recent data from uh, DHCA, uh, related to uh, the rental housing survey, uh, and if there are opportunities for us to have more timely data, you know, not just you know, with this particular subset of data, I think we've got to figure out what do we do right now because we saw from the regional trends and from planning that the numbers, you know, have, there was a shock to the system in COVID, and the question is, you know, what does that recalibration look like? And it looks like it is recalibrating back to more closely aligned with the historical trend. Um, but then moving forward, you know, is there a way for us to be capturing more timely data, you know, as we make these policy decisions moving forward? DHCA has just embarked on their uh, annual uh, survey that goes out to all the landlords. So that is underway right now. So we will have additional and new information uh, forthwith. Um, and that will be available when? I don't have the exact timing, but I would say give it a couple of months because presumably April of 2023, the last yeah. reportable data that we have was from April of yes, 2022. So give or same. take, it's probably around the same exact time frame. Is that fair? That's fair. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I would love as a you know as we figure out takeaways for future conversations uh, to think through if there are better opportunities for us to have more timely rental data because I think the challenge that we have is if we're trying to make real time decisions on funding for rental relief or on major policy decisions and changes if we're basing it off of lagging data that's you know nine or ten months old it makes it, it tough for all of us to operate in that it's nobody's fault it's just a recognition of the realities that we live in and so you know you're on you're on the ground doing this work uh, if you could talk to colleagues and think through and for those in the private sector in the room who receive those surveys, if you could give some thought uh, here as well to uh, you know, other approaches, better ways uh, to do this as well. I think we need better and more timely data to make these uh, decisions and we are limited uh, based on the way that we're set up currently and so I think we need to give that some more thought. Uh, Council Member? I agree with the Chairman. All right, with that, we're going to wrap up. Uh, apologies for uh, running a little bit over time, but this was a terrific discussion and, and conversation. I really appreciate it and am grateful uh, for all of our panelists, for everybody who joined here uh, in person, and for those who tuned in and look forward to our subsequent conversations that we're going to be having on the cost of home ownership in Montgomery County and some of the home ownership uh, programs that we have. We're going to do a deep dive into the housing production fund that we heard a little bit about today, the naturally occurring affordable housing program uh, that uh, has already uh, seen a repayment of its first uh, project over $30 million that uh, we're going to get an update on how that program is working and, and what it can be used for, which is a tool for preservation that we heard about uh, today and several other similar deep dive uh, conversations that uh, bring together stakeholders, focus on data. And so really appreciate everybody's work and look forward to a lot of follow-up conversations that we've identified here today. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.